And do you have a way to time yourself so that you know when it is about 50 minutes or so? Or do you want me to, to stop you somehow? Uh, just remind how, how many minutes I should talk? 45? Around 50. 50. Okay, just remind me at, say, uh, 45 will be fine. Okay, so maybe I will wave uh, something like this. Uh, okay. When, when it is five minutes. Uh, if I can see your screen, of course. <laughs> uh, that's I can see your screen only pop up when you speak. I think the. That's, oh, okay, okay. Yeah. Well, Simone, you have to you have to say something to. Right. Yeah. Then I will say five minutes. Yeah. We are online. Okay, so I think we can start. It's about three o'clock. Maybe. Yeah. It's already two minutes past. Okay. Okay. So, um, so my name is uh, Simone Piccinin. I'm one of the, the organizers and I will be um, uh, hosting this session. And the first speaker of, uh, of today is uh, Professor Jun Cheng from uh, uh, Shaman University. And uh, uh, Professor Cheng got his uh, PhD in uh, Belfast at uh, uh, Queen's University. Uh, and then was a postdoc at uh, uh, the University of Cambridge for a few years before becoming uh, a lecturer in uh, Aberdeen, the University of Aberdeen. And, uh, and then he moved back to, uh, to China, to Shangmen University, uh, where he's now uh, a professor. And his expertise uh, is in the, uh, both in the development and in the application of ab initio methods uh, to the fields of electrochemistry, photocatalysis, and uh, solid liquid interfaces in general. So uh, it's a pleasure to have you here, and the uh, stage is yours. Thank you. Uh, thanks, Pisini, for the uh, kind of uh, uh, introduction, and also a really a pleasure to speak in this nice workshop. I've been enjoying the, uh, the talk, the presentations in the past few days. Uh, it was really nice. Uh, it's also uh, 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 really an honor to give a uh, lecture in, at ICTP. So uh, I have background really um, in computational surface science and surface catalysis. Uh, then I more of the interest moved to Cambridge when I started to look at the electron triangle approach and kind of mainly in solution. So in the last past 10 years or so, I start to look at the interface uh, to basically combine what, what I learned during my PhD was the surface science catalysis and also the electrochemistry side, then we have to bring in the solution. So today I will present what I have been really focused on in the last five years or so, uh, start to look at the, say, uh, the, um, say, structural dynamics, uh, the hub, uh, the uh, interface. Uh, hopefully I'll show you those are really important uh, in catalysis and also in electrochemistry, as many speakers already emphasized in uh, in, uh, in uh, previous few days. Okay, so I I don't have to spend much of time in these slides, I guess, because uh, uh, you already heard a lot about this. So electrochemistry becomes very important because now uh, the en energy applications we have fuel cells, batteries. Uh, um, so the, pro, the Nobel Prize given to the uh, really three pioneers in the field of lithium batteries. And of course, uh, we also uh, um, in the future, maybe also just utilizing the solar energy to convert to chemical fuels. So uh, by using solar cells. So those are all very important applications uh, in um, energy. So, uh, but for this series, we, we, so we try to find what's the most important question in those, uh, for example, the, uh, in electrochemistry. To me, electrochemical interface or electrified interface is really the key to all those uh, um, energy devices I showed you. So electrochemical interface is where the uh, electroconductor meets the ionic conductor. So a certain Faraday, electron or charge transfer event had to happen at the interface so that the, the current can flow across the interface. Um, so if you um, look at the interface, of, uh, we apply field. So that's a very important how the field polarize the interface. As I said, there are two sides of the interface. So uh, normally we think of the liquid electrolyte uh, or electrolyte 
is always very dynamical, but more and more we saw, we realize that the electrode materials also become very dynamical on the reaction condition. Of course, as I mentioned, the charge transfer uh, across the interface and uh, particularly relate to the catalysis. When people want to make useful chemicals, we also need to uh, form chemical bond or break chemical bond on the surface. So my, the, that's the three topics we, uh, our group really focused on in the last few years. So we uh, try to model electric double layers. And uh, um, uh, lately we started to also look at the structural dynamics of the, of the um, uh, uh, electrode. And we also interested in the proton and electron transfer uh, across the interface. So today I will spend some time to show you what I uh, we do uh, the first two topics, the electric double layer, the particular ab initial modeling of electric double layer, and also the structural dynamics and how that uh, impact on catalysis. So um, I just quickly showed you uh, why we want to choose ab initial molecular dynamics. That's to, to, to me is a really good tool for atomistic modeling of electro uh, in the facial chemistry. The reason, um, uh, is, is the following. First of all, if we're interested in catalysis and also we, uh, at the interface, uh, uh, you, the electrochemistry key is the electron transfer and we also apply a voltage to drive electron transfer. So uh, we have to deal with the electron turning structure of the electro or the interface. So uh, the chemist option is also uh, electronic structure effect that's uh, uh, closely related to the catalysis. And uh, on the electrolyte side, of course, we know the solvent reorganized uh, during the charge transfer and also dielectric, dielectric screening effect, uh, the interface. And uh, as I said, the, the surface, the electrosurface surface become very dynamic. So that's uh, another reason I think we also have to look carefully at the dynamics of the interface on both sides. So um, as I just mentioned, I had background in really in computational surface science or surface catalysis. The traditional mass methodology really uh, uh, using DFT and uh, do statical geomimization so that we can, for, for instance, to locate the energy minimum and even search for the subtle point so that we can calculate the energy barriers. Uh, that's a really standard approach already 20 years ago. And if we want to, for example, correct the, uh, for the entropy, we apply certain models like the uh, uh, harmonic approximation so that we can uh, also take into account the zero point energy and the vibration, um, entropy and vibrational entropy and so on. Um, that's, but that only works for really static or low temperature case. But in electrochemistry, we like things moving and also the, Electro, uh, the electrolyte solution, of course, the ions moving is liquid. We can't do water below zero temperature. So that's, uh, we have to take into account the, the dynamic of the electrolyte. And in this case, the standard methodology of modeling the liquid, of course, is for example, the sampling method uh, like uh, molecular dynamics or Monte Carlo, so that we can sample in all kinds of local minimum um, adding, um, uh, uh, basically the configuration of space um, uh, of the ele dynamical electrolyte. And in this case, we, we really have to calculate free energies that will take into account all kinds of configurational entropy associated with uh, the process you are looking at. Um, there are, in free energy calculation community, there are many different kinds of methods. And the, we, the one uh, we're working on uh, together with Michiel Sprig at the Cambridge United Postal in his group, uh, we developed method, for example, to, uh, particularly this uh, particle insertion uh, procedure so that we can calculate, uh, for, example, for example, if the particle electron or proton or any ions, then we can calculate redox potential decays and solvation free energy in aqueous solution. So uh, I guess this, um, I, I don't want to explain this methodology here, but just to mention that in free energy calculation, uh, we can't just calculate or, or sample or only calculate the initial and the final static the energy difference. We have to construct the reversible thermodynamic path 
then we sort of calculate the force along the reaction path. Then we do an integration, the force along the reaction path. So we have to sample the uh, along this, for example, any reaction corner you like, or some. Uh, um, in this case, we uh, have a mapping Hamiltonian, we have a coupling, coupled with the coupling parameter eta. Um, then we, we, we do really several MD sampling corresponding to each point uh, of this parameter that's work as like a uh, reaction coordinate. Then uh, in this case, as a vertical energy gap, we can is like the, the force um, um, acting on this reaction path. Then we do the numerical integration. Okay, we get a reversible work uh, for converting um, uh, from the initial state to the final state, which is the free energy. Okay, those are, uh, I would say the theory is well established in the free energy ca calculation community. Uh, we just implement somehow uh, at the AIMD level and uh, combine with, for example, the uh, particle insertion, uh, different scheme for the proton and the electron transfer, uh, lower workload on the proton insertion process, for instance. Um, okay. So that's the uh, the methodology part we uh, to calculate the free energy. But um, back to electrochemistry. So I, I very often like to draw this uh, using the photoelectrochemical cell, for example. So that's our photo anode, for, in, for instance. Okay, that's our electrolyte. Um, the pioneer in the field for his, uh, the Professor Nozzi already long time ago draw this type of level diagram. So that you can uh, so that you can really assess the uh, thermodynamics or some chemistry of the electron transfer across the interface. That's really the same. Also, um, Professor Gross um, uh, presented the other day uh, uh, in leasing ion battery when jo um, uh, Professor John Good enough look at the, the 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 energy levels in batteries, for instance. Those are all, uh, this really the same. So in this case, for example, we want the reason to do this alignment um, for the band alignment for semiconductor. We have valence band, conduction band edge. So those levels need to straddle the oxygen evolution and the elect uh, hydrogen evolution level in the solution so that the whole have this sufficient thermodynamic driving force to oxidize the water and the electron can reduce the water. So this type of alignment really is, is important. And I have to mention that we only can get those energy level because that also taking uh, has the chemical potential of the electron. So we have to, uh, that have to involve uh, electron, electronic structure calculation. So uh, um, not just electrostatic, but chemical uh, potential as well. Anyway, so it's very important to calculate or at least to cal uh, calculate the uh, potential or electro potential uh, for an interface so that we can compare the experiment because any electrochemistry experiment, uh, you, you always see this is certain measurement done at a certain potential. That's when we uh, can, so that's a really a coverage is very important for the structure of the interface and if we want to compare to experiment, we better have the same potential so that we can compare the, really the same thing with the experiment. So um, you see, just to say it's important to calculate the redox potential. So um, that's the, um, um, but the key really to do alignment, level alignment across the interface is really the, the reference. So we have to take the same reference for the electrode and the electrolyte solution so that we can compare the levels. And in electrochemistry, um, uh, people use reference electrode, uh, the most common one, the so-called uh, standard hydrogen electrode. There are many other uh, silver, silver chloride electrode and caramel uh, electrode and so on. So we, we really um, learned from, from them that we developed this so-called computational standard hydrogen electro. Uh, in electrochemistry, that's, it, it's just a redox half reaction, uh, say, for converting a gas phase hydrogen molecule 
into a solvate proton and this electron in the vacuum. So that's basically this redox half reaction, this energy level associated or redox level associated with this half reaction uh, is the uh, standard hydrogen electrode. So um, then we, we calculate the levels both at the um, um, in electrode and in the electrolyte and converting those levels to the standard hydrogen um, electrode scale. So uh, then we, we, we really um, bridge um, our say automatic model to uh, electrochemistry um, experiments. But to just to mention to calculate this um, standard hydrogen electrode, all we need to do is calculate solvation free energy of protons. That's basically this species in our cell so that we can convert in all the energy levels with respect to the standard hydrogen electrode. Uh, and the solvation free energy of proton can be calculated by the methodology I just described using this particle of proton insertion scheme um, that uh, Laura developed with me here uh, quite a while ago. Okay, just some uh, numbers. Okay, we uh, that's all the um, uh, that's the redox potential and ca uh, pKs uh, calculated uh, using our initial molecular dynamics. In, in just that's also all in pure water. Just to show you, the pKa is normally quite good in solution already. Uh, the GGA level uh, using hybrid functional, you got similar accuracy for the redox potential. Um, clearly, GGA is the error is too large. The, the hybrid function already reduced uh, half the, the error. So that is important. Um, the reason, of course, associated with the so-called de uh, delocalization error in the, uh, in the standard um, GGA functional and the hybrid functional can really improve. Um, but OK, that's not the point today. Just to mention that we could, using high level theory, uh, it's important to get the band gap right of the water so that we can calculate the uh, uh, calculate the, the accurate energy levels. So the accuracy really can be improved with higher energy electronic structure theories. In this case, we can we, we tried RPA and the high double hybrid functional we can indeed see the improvement. Um, okay, but. Um, in the following, since we are uh, most of the time dealing with metals, so GGA normally give very good work function. So uh, we don't have to worry about the error or uncertainty from the density functionals. So I will not uh, mention that in the following. Um, okay, so that's the um, um, the model, the platinum water interface model uh, we use. Um, so as you can see, normally we have, uh, say in this case, around 150 platinum atoms and uh, roughly 150 uh, water molecule. So we have a full periodic boundary condition so that we have two symmetric interface in our model. So that you can think of this slab, this platinum slab. Also, you have a, its periodic image here. Then you, you have two symmetric interface. So uh, we could, with current computational power, we could do say 10, 20, or if you really want to extend to 50, that's okay, but we can't really do too long, right? The, um, because the uh, computational cost of the uh, uh, AIMD is really, really high. Um, okay, um, the, uh, for metal, it's also it's really expensive um, uh, when we using CP2K, so the, um, the hybrid, the semiconductor can, the wave function of semiconductor can uh, get converged rather quickly, but metal uh, tend to be much slower. So uh, at that time, that's my first PhD student, Jia Bo at Aberdeen. When we do that, we can't really do like full solvation free energy calculation of proton in a metal water interface model because it, it's just too expensive. We have to think of some trick. So we using another, so another reference basically aligned, for example, the electrostatic potential in the water, bulk of water. So that's our interface model. That's our, for example, 32 standard 32 pure water box model. We do a, an extra alignment of the electrostatic potential, okay, calculated from DFT. And uh, this second alignment um, really helps because uh, we then 
just using the solvation free energy proton in a pure water box, okay? Using that free energy, solvation free energy combined with this correction or this second alignment uh, in the uh, electrostatic potential of pure water so that we, we, we can avoid direct calculating the uh, solvation uh, free energy proton in the interface box, uh, interface model. Okay, that can save us, us a lot of time. So we only need to run like 10 pick second the AIMD of the interface model. We can already do the, uh, uh, for example, calculate the level alignment. In this case, uh, we don't charge the surface. So that's corresponding to the potential of zero charge. That's really uh, a fundamental property of the metal interface and can be measured uh, by experiment. So just quickly show you the number we have. So um, that's the number we calculated for different uh, metal surface. Uh, the numbers in the bracket actually are the experimental value. Uh, just to point out that we do check the, uh, for in this case, we take some snapshot for platinum uh, from the PBE trajectory. We calculate the hybrid functional. We don't see much of difference, just still a small difference, but uh, the, really that's within our statistical, almost within our statistical uncertainty. So it's small. And there's a sort of big difference for palladium. Uh, and we check the reason for that is the error in the functional uh, uh, for the um, work function. That's the, uh, the work function of metal in, in vacuum, right? So that's a roughly half EV error. So that's really carries this error from the from, from the work function um, predicted by PBE. But anyway, so we also calculate the work function of metals using the same functional um, at the, uh, in vacuum. So does a, uh, if we converting this potential of zero charge with respect to standard Hatch electro to absolute scale, Okay, that's this famous 4.44. So we can convert it to, to the vacuum scale. Then we take the difference. Okay, that's essentially uh, is this delta phi uh, in electrochemistry is called the volta potential difference or outer potential difference. That's when you the energy difference moving an electron direct from the metal to the vacuum just outside the metal surface in the vacuum, of course. Or you can take it another way from the elect removing electron cross the water interface and put in the vacuum just outside the water surface. Okay. There are two vacuum here, but those the two vacuums have different potentials. Okay, this difference is so-called the water potential difference. Okay. Um, you can see, um, that's the experimental value, that's our value, that's really close. So that's a good sign. Our methodology is good, is also independent uh, of, of, of the functional we use. So um, what caused this difference, particularly if we look at plat platinum and palladium, the difference is a slot is more than one EV. Okay, but for Gold and silver, silver is is small. They are smaller. Um, in experiment, people think the water uh, will take a certain orientation at the interface, um, even at the potential of zero charge. That's where you don't have net charge on the on the surface because the water already take a certain orientation. Uh, then we look we look at the structure we have from the MD trajectory. We analyze the water orientation. We calculate the water dipole, this water dipole profile. So that's our uh, surface. That's really along the surface normal direction. You can see up and down and uh, platinum, gold, uh, platinum, that's palladium and uh, gold, the silver, the smaller, but it, that we integrate over we actually got very small uh, potential, okay, um, from this water orientational dipole. So that, that's potential really in, in, integrate out if you do it. But on the other hand, we we check the um, uh, the structure carefully. Uh, that's actually common. Uh, it's actually well known in surface science. 
water can come off on platinum or palladium, right? That's a water comes off on the surface, you, you, you have rather large water chemical option energy on those surfaces. Um, then, of course, chemical option is, is like chemical bond, right? You will form a bond between a met metal and the water. You expect there will charge transfer or charge redistribution because forming this, uh, this chemical uh, of the water. Then we look at the so-called uh, electron, uh, electron density profile, okay? Uh, uh, the electron density profile difference, okay, before and after the wa uh, putting water on the surface, then you can clearly see for plat for platinum and palladium, okay, there's a, a quite a large charge, uh, electron density really uh, move from the surface to uh, from uh, say from the water towards the surface. Uh, we see a much smaller. Uh, charge transferred on inner metal, gold and silver, okay? And uh, that uh, is not clear from this picture, but if you look also analyze the, uh, the electronic density of state, this water A, that's, that's what, those are the uh, chemicals of the water. You can see there's uh, really a density of state. Now uh, goes above the Fermi level, that's basically showing the, this electron density here move to the Fermi level of the metal, but in the bulk water, you clearly see there's a big gap, right? So that's really a, a, a electronic structure effect and uh, um, the, the, that can cause a large potential shift, even at the potential of zero charge on platinum and the palladium. So um, previous that was a, a potential of zero charge condition. Of course, we want to model the electric double layer. So in, in electrochemistry, we know that if we apply a potential div, uh, different from the potential of zero charge, okay, you will uh, start to build up charge on the surface. So positive or negative, then you will uh, really attract the counter ions from the electric double layer. Um, so we, we basically now in our calculation, we, we, we still have periodic boundary condition in here. We uh, basically just insert some certain counter ions. In this case, case, sodium just near the interface. So this blue balls here, that is uh, 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 sodium atom. We insert the whole balls keep neutral. And uh, on the other side, we, we have the same number of sodium. So because it's periodic boundary conditions, these two interfaces interfaces are really symmetric, okay? Uh, it's not anode and a cathode, that's really the same electrode that I just want to point out. Um, anyway, uh, in the electronic structure condition, uh, electronic structure calculation, if I have a, uh, put a, a sodium atom in the sol uh, water solution, uh, they will have certain solvation structure, then the ground state of the whole cell will, uh, will be, the, this will become a cation, sodium plus, and the electron will automatically uh, go to the metal surface. Uh, that's really the ground state of the electron. So then the wave function optimization procedure in DFT can already do the uh, proper charge assignment for us. Okay, that is good. We have the negative charge surface and we have sodium ion near the interface that will form a, uh, uh, electric double layer. Okay. Uh, in our case, we can't simulate diffuse layer right now because the time, the size and time scale really doesn't allow us to do the calculation uh, to simulate uh, the diffu diffuse layer. So we claim we are simulating the compact double layer. Okay. That's we, because we put the ions just very close to the surface where we, our MD just sort of equilibrates the structure. Uh, near the interface at the time scale, we don't see uh, the time scale we have, we don't see the, the sodium ion move away from the surface. So we don't see a net flux, okay, or, or a current, say, between this interface to the bulk water. So that's sort of, say, uh, uh, we don't have this equilibrium between the, um, the uh, counter ion and the ions in the solution. So that's sort of mimic the condition uh, the high concentration limit that uh, all the when the uh, diffuse layer is suppressed, so all the counter charge is compact. Uh, uh, 
uh, at, at the home host plane, okay, near the interface. So that's the model we have. What do we do? We, we, we can change the number of atoms or sodium ions we put in the solution. Then we, have, we will have different model corresponding to the different, different uh, surface charge density. Then we, using our computational standard hydrogen electrode, we can calculate the electrode potential for each metal, for each interface with respect to the standard hydrogen electrode. Okay, so that we can compare to experiment. Anyway, so that's our model we have. Um, then we, we, we can assign the electrode potential of that model correspond to uh, which experimental condition. So that's collaborate with my colleague in Xiamen, Professor Jian Fengli and Zhong Chuntian. They have this special technique, uh, they call the shiners. It's a surface enhanced romance spec uh, technique so that they can really um, uh, uh, magnify the signal from, uh, uh, really the signal from the water just on, at the interface. Okay, then they can assess the romance spectrum of the interface water. So we, we sort of calculate the VDOS of the water, the interface water, uh, then we, we compare, but it's not exact compar com uh, comparison because we, we don't calculate the polarizability. So we don't have the intensity is not there yet, but the, uh, we only use the peak position. But the, uh, the point is we, we really can see uh, that the, um, the Raman shift corresponds to the OH uh, stretching mode. That's really the peak position. So uh, that's the uh, experimental result, okay? Uh, as a function of potential, you can see the Roman shift, okay? Uh, from the, uh, goes to, from the potential zero charge goes to the negative, more negative potential. So that negative charge surface, uh, that's our result, okay? So it's not perfect, um, but if you really look carefully, we do s reproduce these two transition, okay, uh, these two potentials, clearly you see a slope change. Okay, uh, the students really, they work together, uh, Jia, Jia Bo, that's um, my, my PhD student and uh, Chao Yu who did all the experiment, they, they really uh, talk a lot. And uh, then uh, Jia Bo did a lot of an, uh, anal, uh, analysis on the water structure and the interface. And I think they really present a convincing evidence that the structural change of the water corresponding to that two transitions in the Roman shift. Uh, I just quickly show you this picture. Okay, uh, the potential of zero charge, as I mentioned, that uh, the water at the interface is more or less light, uh, flat. You don't have net uh, orientational preference. So, uh, but if you start to negative charge your surface, okay, the water will turn around, start to have a proton point into the surface. So uh, as you would expect, because the proton is, uh, say, uh, po uh, have fractional positive charge. So they were attracted by the negative surface, uh, that negative charge surface. Okay, when you reduce, say, the potential get more negative, then you have more water pointing to the uh, the, the hydrogen to the surface, okay? At some point, that this potential, that's the first, the first transition I showed you in the Roman spectra in the last slide, that's where you we see all the interface water pointing this hydrogen atom to the surface. It's sort of saturated at this point. When the potential goes, there's a potential window, you get more negative, the water just can't move, it's saturated at this point, okay? But if, um, when we close to minus two volt with respect to a uh, point of zero charge, we start to see the water make another turn so that we have this two hydrogen down water uh, start to appear, okay, at this, this second transition, um, uh, the uh, Roman shift. Okay, and in this case, that of course, if you have very negative uh, potential, the field is so strong, the water has to align its dipole uh, um, with the, uh, uh, against the direction of the electrical potential. Okay, and in that case, uh, uh, that's a really pure electrostatic. I would say when we have one hydrogen down, you can still form certain hydrogen 
bond uh, with neighboring water. So, but in this case, that will minimize uh, the uh, hydrogen bonding, but of course, um, in favor of electrostatic interaction uh, with the electric field. Um, <clears throat> okay. Um, of course, what we really interested in also uh, the, uh, the those structure is try to understand the dielectric property of the water at the interface. So, as I mentioned, that we we can change the surface charge density. We calculate the potential, right? So then we we will we really can uh, can calculate this charging curve. Take the derivative that's already give us the the uh, capacitance of the top layer. So actually, so that's the. Uh, in this case, uh, we don't see much of thread. It's rather constant. So uh, on gold, around we get around thirty. That's also what experimental C uh, for 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 many metal. The dielectric or the Helmholtz capacitance or the dielectric uh, differential capacitance of Helmholtz double layer or the compact double layer is around 20, 20 30 microfarad per uh, centimeter square. So uh, that is constant, not quite. So in the sense that is is flat, right? The constant, the dielectric constant is is constant as as function as potential. Uh, I I want to show you an, uh, a really different case uh, in platinum, where um, we we really do the same calculation. I just show you for the gold. Uh, we change the surface charge density. We calculate the electrical potential, but I I want to show you. The, uh, the structure of the interface at the uh, negative and the positive charged surface, okay? Uh, at the negative charge, as I sh also already show you for the, uh, for the gold, all the hydrogen point that, okay? That's more or less what we expect. So at the positive charge surface, we have many water with oxygen sit on top of platinum, okay? As I mentioned, in the, at the potential zero charge, you already have a fraction of Water chemisorbed on this on the surface. That's actually those are all chemisorbed water on the surface. Okay. Um, if we look the say that's the surface coverage of the chemisorbed the water as a function of potential, we have this sort of S shape. Okay. So previously I show you the potential zero charge. There are certain the roughly 0.2 mononair water chemisorbed. That can already give us, if you remember, around one volt interface potential due to the charge redistribution due to chemisorption. Okay. And when we get to negative, okay, since the, the water needs to take a configuration as that, that the hydrogen point down to the surface, that will really that process would basically force the water to dissolve. Okay, then the chem of the water is gone. You can also see the peak as a graduation decrease. But anyway, that's uh, that's already clear here at a very negative potential. You don't see uh, uh, any chemicals of the water. When you increase the potential, you as now you would expect that the water will you will be get more water chemicals. So. Uh, so around one volt with respect to the potential zero charge. So it's sort of saturated around half mononair. Okay, so that's the, um, that's the uh, chemical of the water, uh, the coverage. Okay, then that's also this charging curve I uh, sh show you. This is now structure is not like linear. I showed you for the gold. Now you get a, a shape. Okay, that the charge density as a function of potential. Is not linear anymore. Then you will is bad. You see, you can see certain structure in the differential capacitance of this uh, Helmholtz double layer. Okay, um, uh, that's I already explained. Uh, at the potential zero charge, you have chemicals of the water that can lead to a around one volt potential drop due to charge transfer uh, when you have chemicals of the water. Uh, the negative potential, you, the water now can dissolved, you don't have this contribution. So this uh, red line I, uh, I showed here. So you don't have this contribution due to this charge electron, uh, this charge effect, this uh, elec uh, electronic density effect, if you like. So that's uh, that's at potential zero charge. When you increase 
the potential get more positive, you have more water can absorb, you actually have more contribution from here. And if you look more carefully that this potential, if you increase this potential uh, uh, from left to, to right, you, uh, you increase the potential of the, 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 uh, the metal surface, you actually see this potential increase increases uh, due to the chem absorption. Okay, not instead of like dielectric response, you always try to minimize the effect, the impact of the applied voltage. That actually de increase, not decrease. Then you will expect the sort of like negative, so um, dielectric or negative capacitance uh, behavior. Um, okay, that what we um, we uh, so uh, using this. Um, um, Hem horse absorption, uh, sorry, Franken absorption, hypertherm, because this water can really carve the car the chem absorption of water really uh, can change uh, um, uh, with the potential. So we we sort of develop a theoretical model to describe this process. But the point is, so we we now can view this hem horse that's a really compact double layer, and I think that can be treated as two capacitors. Uh, in series. So one is the common, uh, this, uh, this seesaw, this um, due to the more of a dielectric response due to water orientation. Um, that's the standard one uh, normally you, for, for, uh, in the case of very inert metal like mercury, you get rough, almost flat around 20 or 30, as I also show you for the gold case. But there's another component due to the water absorption and desorption, uh, as I just explained. So that's another contribution. Okay, so uh, they, they actually connect in ser a series. So that's this, uh, then the overall hem horse capacitance uh, uh, can be written in this form. Um, so that's our, in here, this seesaw is shown in this flat. This line I show is constant around 20, but for this, can absorb the water country. Uh, this component due to water chem absorption give you another component, okay? That's actually negative and it's um, um, uh, uh, give you this shape, okay? This sort of U shape. Um, if we combine those two, the overall capacitance now, of course, is always positive. It has to be, and you will have a bell shape. And you have a maximum at slight at the potential slightly more positive at potential zero charge. Okay, um, this blue curve is actually what we can calculate. We develop model and we uh, fit in a few parameters. So that's the this black curves I show in here can reproduce all the calculations. So uh, we really convinced that uh, there's a, another dielectric uh, response. Um, uh, due to the, the water can absorption is an electronic structure if I, I would like to mention. And also the, uh, that's the, what the experimentally uh, measured. Uh, of course, that's a very uh, complicated impedance spectroscopy measurement. They have to uh, decouple the contribution from the uh, uh, pseudo capacitance due to, uh, for example, hydrogen uh, absorption and so on. Anyway, so they also have similar maximum, this bell shape at the potential slightly more positive. The reason why this peak uh, is on the, is more positive than the potential zero charge, the reason we would like to present is uh, if using this uh, Franken absorption isotherm model, so the uh, maximum should, should occur at the, say, at the, car uh, the coverage of surface water, uh, um, basically taking half of the maximum. So in this case, the maximum uh, surface water coverage at a very positive potential is around 0 0.25, uh, 0 0.5 half monanair. Then the maximum should occur at half of half monanair. That's roughly 2 point, uh, 0 0.25 monanair, but uh, at the potential of zero charge, uh, we only have like 0 0.2 monanair. That's, uh, that's the reason this maximum is more positive than the, uh, than the potential of zero charge. 
Okay. Uh, we we think that this bell-shaped compass uh, differential compactness is rather uh, universal, and we also uh, uh, look at the oxide uh, water interface. In this case, we're using this final fuel method, um, actually uh, initially proposed by uh, Stenger, Spalding, and uh, Vanderbilt uh, to treat the ferroelectrics in in solid, and then Mihil. Uh, um, really see this connection uh, with the electrochemistry and together with Charles, they develop this nice uh, uh, technique to really uh, model the, um, the electric doublet in a sort of asymmetric model uh, using final field method. Okay, I, I will not explain to that, he already uh, explained that in the first day. Um, I just using this methodology and look at um, one type of oxide, tin oxide water interface. The reason we, we look at the tin oxide, because I know uh, water really, um, just a really lively proton hopping event occur at the tin oxide. So water will naturally uh, dissociate on tin oxide. You will, you will get a mixed structure with half water dissociate uh, um, uh, on, on tin oxide. When we calculate the, the uh, using the method, uh, the final field method, calculating the differential capacitance, we again see a bell shaped differential capacitance. But in this case, if we, uh, at least the key, there's many fa other factors, but the key fix physics behind this is really, I show you in here, when we change the surface charge density, that alpha is the water dissociation ra ratio. Okay, so uh, around Point of, um, point of zero charge, that's when you don't have net charge on the surface. Um, it's also PZC, but it's different from the potential of zero charge at metal. So that's the pH, the P, uh, uh, pH condition uh, when the oxide surface carries no net proton charge. Um, anyway, that's called the point of zero charge, the pH condition. So we have roughly how, okay. Um, it seems I have to <laughs> rush. Okay, so we have like half um, um, uh, the potential zero charge water dissociated. When we change the potential, uh, change the surface charge density, we really can the water dissociation ratio can really change. So the water can get more water dissociated and less water dissociated on the surface. That will once the water dissociated, you will, dissociation you will have a different uh, uh, dipole really correspond to, uh, uh, that will contribute to the dielectric response of the overall water at the interface. That will give you this maximum, okay, uh, at oxide interface. So that's a really a symmetry. And we think that's a fundamental for, for all interface, not just for metal, also for oxide. Um, since I don't have much time I have to really, uh, uh, I really want to touch on this topic. Um, I want to spend uh, perhaps five or eight minutes on this, this part. So uh, as I mentioned that uh, on the previous part, we talked about the, the, really the structure change of the water, of the water interface of water. Now we also, I also want to uh, point out that the, uh, the, the electrode really become very lively uh, on the reaction condition, but the point of is uh, we, we can't really simulate the whole interface right now. So we, we sort of shift back to say uh, 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 heterogeneous catalysis where I just look at the, the, the uh, for example, some sort of metal clusters. Uh, for now, we, we, uh, we, we don't um, include the solvent. Okay. But uh, anyway, uh, if you can see this slides, uh, it's two movies. That's a TEM movie. You can see the metal cluster on the support. They really change at the ambient condition. And there's a AIMD simulation. You can see the cluster really also very dynamical, uh, particularly if you have a CO absorber on this gold cluster. But just to point out that this comparison is not, on, it's not really, uh, say, helpful. The, in the sense that experimentally, the time resolution for a TEM is around, say, uh, one millisecond. Okay, but the AIMD, we say that we have normally have like ten picseconds. So there's a orders magnitude difference in the time scale. So 
uh, although they all always look very dynamical, but they are really different time scale. Um, if we look at the cat catalyst uh, in, in, in industry, people, every catalyst will eventually uh, become dead, okay? It will deactivate, uh, depend uh, the microscopic time scale uh, for, uh, for uh, say one year or two, they will, they will have to replace that. So the catalyst certainly have certain life span, okay? Those are all the cluster will become sedentary, restructure, risk, uh, uh, segregation. This, but that very often happens at the, the time scale, for example, the experimental right now, the PM can see. So at a sort of milli or second or second uh, time scale or even hours. But for the chemical reaction, very often we look at so elementary step of always happen on the time scale of Pick second, so or any catalytic cycle, they go to uh, microsecond. There's a clear real separation of time scale. Okay, then uh, that's also justify why in heterogeneous catalysis people do calculate or static geometrization so that we can only uh, basically see uh, the atoms move on the surface. We always sort of keep the metal surface. Uh, uh, rather uh, almost like fixed because they really the, the motion between these two uh, type of events really uh, um, uh, have a, a very large separation in time scale. But the underlying question is really what if the time scale of the dynamic evolution of catalyst structure overlaps with that of chemical reactions? Uh, it could happen, just think about it, it could happen if we have, a, for example, a small cluster Oh, that's now become uh, rather popular these days in catalysis community. Uh, it's realized that uh, many, many, many um, active catalysts are uh, single class or even single atoms. Um, anyway, uh, but just to po point out, we, we, we should also look at this possibility. Then in this case, uh, if we want to look at dynamic system, we need to calculate the free energy, uh, as I mentioned, uh, so we we uh, we the methodology we use is just really standard so uh, potential uh, of mean force so we calculate the free energy profile for example in this case oxygen dissociation I go to certain cluster we don't fix anything allow everything move um, during the MD simulation uh, so we calculate the free energy profile of oxygen dissociation and we can also evaluate the temperature effect so that we can calculate the free energy profile at different temperature, okay? Um, clearly you see the destructure very different at the final temperature compared to that at zero Kelvin, right? But the point is I, I, uh, we really want to quantify the reaction entropies, okay? In physical chemistry, we calculate the free energy at different temperature, then we take the free the, uh, basically the temperature derivative of free energy so that we can calculate the, free, the entropy, right? So that's our uh, free energy, uh, uh, reaction free energy, that, uh, that's a reaction um, free energy barrier. Okay, that's really similar. Uh, so then uh, I only focus on this red, red curve, that's a reaction free energy, okay, that's the overall reaction. Then, you can clearly see there's a feature, right? That uh, when we change the temperature, uh, and if we using just static, say geometrization and correct the entropy, we don't see any any feature in here. It's always flat. Now we see this big jump, really, uh, at certain temperature. Then if we take the derivative, it's really magnified in fact. Now we have a huge peak, okay, at this transition temperature around. 300, 400 Kelvin. Okay, another uh, uh, point I want to point out, this entropy is on the order of 2000 joule per mole per Kelvin. That's gigantic um, entropy change. Okay, uh, we were puzzled. And if we then look carefully, uh, we realize that can only happen for phase transition. So such an entropy, large entropy change. Then we start to investigate the uh, the phase transition behavior of those clusters. Um, uh, I, so I just want to quickly show you. So for the cluster, you will have, uh, that's sort of, that's uh, the 
uh, capacity, uh, the heat capacity curve. We increase the temperature, we calculate average the enthalpy or that's a total energy here. We see the jump. So that's uh, of course when the, the cluster start to melt. Okay, that's corresponding to liquid phase. Since it's a finite system, we don't have the first order phase transition. Otherwise you will have discontinuity here is a so-called quasi first order phase transition. So you will have a range of temperature corresponding to the solid liquid coexistence states. Um, okay, that's for the reactant when you have an oxygen that molecule absorbed on the surface, but just to point out at the product, okay, you actually can see, um, to say similarly, we can see this phase transition behavior, but the melting temperature is different from that for, of the reactant state, okay? That's can kind of also see from the heat compa uh, capacity curve, okay? The maximum will give sort of the melting point. You can see clearly they are different. Okay, just quickly, I want to summarize this in this figure. Um, so just think about at a low temperature, when this reactant and product are all solid state-like, okay? They have both states have very low entropy, okay? Then their difference reaction entropy will be small. At a high temperature, when both cluster melt, they both have high entropy, but they have small, the difference, the reaction entropy is still small. However, at the, there's a transition temperature range. When, for instance, in this case, the reactant steel is more solid state-like. So there's still low entropy, but the product still to melt. You can see this rise in the entropy. Then the consequence is really the reaction entropy will increase, okay, at this point. Of course, after that, the world goes down, but at that temperature range, you, would, you can see there will be a huge increase in the reaction entropy, just a decrease in the free energy, reaction free energy. So that's really one state melts while the other doesn't. And then you expect there's an anomalous increase in the reaction entropy. Uh, similarly, we see that in a supported model catalyst. So that's the same trend I will not uh, uh, go through it again, but just to point out that this really what uh, uh, could be a real catalyst. Okay, almost finished. So just uh, that's the, uh, we see other cluster, we see this similar, that's the oxygen dissociation on copper 13. Uh, we, we, we see similar uh, situation, there's a phase transition, but in this case, um, that's can, uh, we have a liquid to solid phase transition will give a sort of reversed peak. So that in this case, they will disfavor the dissociation reaction in contrast to the uh, the, uh, the example I just showed you. Uh, and they also has size sensitivity. Uh, I just want to point out this entropy curve even have this pulse complex, pulse shape. The reason for that is just the melting temperature range. So in this case, if it's very wide compared to a very narrow coexistence co region, they can give really complex uh, uh, entropy curve. Okay. So with that, uh, oh, that's my last slide, just to point out, really, Cali is really dynamical. Uh, that uh, could be something uh, similar to uh, what uh, in enzyme catalysis, people think of the protein dynamics is key for the enzyme catalysis. So I just want to point out that we always think chemistry or catalysis is rather like local because the chemical bonding is local, but it could couple with the non-local environment in our case. The cuddly itself is, can provide such an environment. It's a collection, collective motion of all the atoms in the, in the, in the cluster really can affect the, this uh, local chemical uh, bonding forming or uh, breaking. So um, I just want to point out that. So I will give the con conclusion. Um, I, I really want to thank the, um, the group. Um, so I really enjoy uh, working with my students. They are uh, they're, they're really helpful and the discussions are always uh, enjoy a lot. And the, 
and the collaborators, uh, particularly Mihil is also in the panelists and many other people. I enjoy the collaboration as child, probably also in the uh, audience and as the funding agency. I, with this, I think I, I will end. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. And uh, we can go straight to uh, some questions from the audience. And I will let Arthur Agopian, uh, you should be able to, to speak now if you unmute yourself. Yes. So can you, you hear me? And ask your question. Yes, we can hear you. Yeah. OK. Uh, hello, uh, Professor Cheng. Thank you for this nice presentation. This is Arthur Agopian from uh, Montpellier in France. So I would like to know, have you ever computed the zero charge potential in vacuum? So I mean, without uh, any explicit solvent molecule, because maybe uh, the difference in zero charge potential that you observe for platinum and gold, for instance, uh, could not necessarily only be uh, due to the water reorientation, but could also be uh, an intrinsic property of uh, metals. Uh, you mean calculate the potential of zero charge in vacuum, right? That, that's basically uh, work yeah. function. Yeah, that's basically this yeah, called. Exactly. Yeah, yeah, yes. the, yeah the, then the difference between the potential zero charge for an interface and the work function for the surface in vacuum, um, that in experiments, this difference is called the delta phi, the vacuum, uh, water potential difference. That's a quantity can be measured. And we claim that uh, is due to a electronic structure, in fact, uh, due to the water chemistry option, uh, particularly for the uh, platinum. Uh, I, I, I mean, the, the, difference, the difference you observe in between the gold and platinum or the zero charge potential, uh, maybe it's not only due to the water orientation, which is different from gold and platinum, but could also be an intrinsic property of metals. Yeah. Uh, Okay, it's not the water orientation. I also said that uh, it's due to the chemical option of water. Uh, um, yeah. 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 Did okay. I understand your question correctly? Or? Mm. Anyway, I think we can move to. Oh, I mean, it's... Oh, sorry, go ahead. Okay, go ahead. okay. Thank you. Oh, okay. Yeah. So maybe we can go yeah. ahead with the second so, uh, question. It's, it's coming from uh, Ali Hassanali. So Ali, I think you can talk. Okay, uh, thank you. So this is uh, Ali Hassanali from ICTP. Thank you for your talk. Uh, your, your results on the, the change in the water orientation was very interesting. So I was curious, have you, um, from both the theoretical and, and experimental side, has anyone looked at the evolution of the dielectric constant? uh in these systems uh from either the ab initio or or experimentally because you you might expect to see some significant changes there right uh, yeah that's um i would say uh, in classical uh, uh for example molecular dynamic simulation community people certainly look at those in fact mm -hmm. uh particularly in how many liquid right? and many people look at the uh, differential combustions uh, you know there's a molten salt um, or any highly concentrated system. There, there are many other simulations, but the point that I want to point out here because because uh, the initial molecular dynamics simulation is rather expensive because very rarely people look at the uh, capacitance of the uh, double layer. Um, uh, in, in our work, we, we would like to propose that the, the electronic structure uh, mm -hmm. is very important uh, to correctly uh, say uh, capture this differential, this bell shaped differential combustions, uh, because the water can absorb and dissolve. That's that can only capture by by the um, by the uh, BFT, for instance. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. So 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 basically, it would not be possible to converge a dielectric constant from the ab initio. Uh, I think people working on this now. Uh, it's still possible, right? Uh, we are also calculating. This. You are, yeah, yeah. But of course, that depends on. Uh, in this case, we, as I said, we don't have diffuse layer, right? Not fully. Okay. Okay. Thanks. Yeah. Thank you, and we have one final question from uh, Professor Axel Gross. So, Axel. Yeah, yeah. June, thank you very much for this excellent talk. Uh, I have Hi. a kind of pretty technical question, but which has a more fundamental background. 
here you plotted at several slides properties as a function of the surface charge density. Now in electronic structure calculation, charges are in fact hard to determine because you need to know where to integrate over. So how did you determine your surface charge densities? How did you define them? Okay, uh, uh, thanks for the question. Yeah, it's actually rather straightforward for us. We only, we, we basically count in how many ions we put in, right? So that's also what, say, uh, experiment electrochemistry would use. So that's, um, the charge measured in electrochemistry is by color, right? That's the electron flow in or out the electrode uh, through the uh, external circuit, okay? So we don't have to do the, for instance, for instance, the charge separation at the interface. Well, I only count in how many counter ions we have on the surface. Okay. Yeah. That's and then you say it's just compensated by the electrons at the surface, at yeah. the metal electrode. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Because the whole interface region have to keep neutral, right? Then the yeah, electron sure. flow in the system and then the counter ions uh, uh, diffuse from the electrolyte, bulk electrolyte. Mm -hmm. that's, that's what the uh, electrochemistry method is. Yeah. Okay, thank you very much. Okay, so I, I see that there are more questions, but uh, we don't have much, much time and uh, we need to move on to uh, the second talk. So thanks again, June. And okay. I just stop sharing here. Okay. And there you go, perfect. So uh, the second talk will be given by Professor Roel uh, van de Kroll. And uh, uh, he got his uh, PhD at the University of Technology in Delft. Um, then he moved to, to the US for a postdoc at MIT. And then came back to Delft as an assistant professor. And then he became a, a professor at the Te Technical University um, in Berlin, in Germany. And uh, he's also the head of the Institute for Solar Fuels, uh, the Helmholtz uh, Centrum in, uh, in Berlin, in Germany. And his expertise is in the development of uh, materials and devices for photoelectrochemical uh, conversion of sunlight to chemical fuels. So Professor van der Kroll, stage is yours. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for the nice introduction. Um, can you see my screen and cursor okay? Can you hear me okay? Yes, everything. Yes, works. yes. Mm -hmm. I'm just trying to get rid of this. Do you also see this uh, screen sharing thing? Uh, I'm trying to get rid of that, but is it not visible? Oh, no, we don't. No. Well, we oh, okay, don't perfect. Any, perfect. Any such thing. All right, great. Okay, so good afternoon, everybody. Uh, thank you very much to the organizers for inviting me to uh, share uh, some of our results and some of our thoughts on, on solid liquid interfaces uh, in, in the work we do at the Institute for Solar Fuels at the Helmholtz Center Berlin. Uh, and today I, I want to share with you some of the work we've done on ambient pressure, uh, hard X-ray photoelectron spectroscopy on, on photoelectrodes for water splitting. And at the end, I'll also uh, show you some results on liquid droplet trains and try to argue that that's also a, a, a potentially very interesting system for studying solid liquid interfaces. Um, uh, now I try to go to the next screen. Yeah. Um, okay, so I, I, I don't think I need to explain to you the, let's say, the, the need and the interest also in, in producing hydrogen, green hydrogen, for instance, with, with sunlight and, and water. Um, and, and when you think about that, uh, that's basically one of our main goals to do this. Uh, and when you think about that, you have to think about what the current state of the technology is. The current state of the technology is, of course, shown over here. Uh, it's just simply coupling a, a, a photovoltaic solar cell to an electrolyzer. Uh, both are commercially available. And then you may or may not have to put a DC, DC, DC converter uh, in between. So, so this is how renewable green, truly green hydrogen uh, can be produced uh, today, uh, already at, at quite large scale. Um, so, so there's a couple of issues there. Of course, there, there's many components, right? There's, there's at least three different components. All these have to be packaged, they have to be wired and so on. And that means that the cost is still relatively high. So the cost for solar electricity is, is, is low at the moment, but, but putting all this together uh, uh, is a, represents a significant capital investment. 
The good thing is that you can optimize each of these components individually, right? So it, it allows you to get the maximum out of the uh, efficiency. And if you use commercial electrolyzers, you can also produce the hydrogen at, at pressure. Uh, and, and that is, for instance, important if you want to you know, fill tanks, you usually have to do this under pressure. Um, one of the, or let's say, there are also some problems here, right? So the problem is that alkaline electrolyzers, that's the 100-year-old the dominant electrolyzer technology, uh, they are not really compatible with the intermittent nature of sunlight. So they work fantastic if they are kept running at 100% all the time. But uh, if, if the sun doesn't shine at night, uh, these electrodes, they basically corrode away. That's just iron and nickel and something like six molar KOH. And that's not stable if you don't run this, this machine uh, uh, by putting a current through it. You can address that by using PEM electrolyzers, so polymer electrolyte membrane electrolyzer, but those, those always need noble metals, right? They, they are working acid uh, uh, under acidic conditions, and there you need things like platinum and iridium to make it work. And of course, that's in terms of cost, that's not a big issue, but, but one wonders if, if it's uh, possible to scale this up really to a terawatt uh, scale uh, technology. And then finally, and that's a little bit underappreciated perhaps, is that heat also reduces the efficiency. So as you, I think you know that, that solar panels heat up when you put them in the sun, and that reduces their efficiency. They don't like this. And that's actually bad because you, you want this heat in the electrolyzer. So it would be great if you could somehow transfer the heat from the solar cell where, where, it, where it's bad towards the electrolyzer where it would actually help to increase the reaction kinetics. And one way to do that is to try and integrate these functionalities. And that, that's really the, the, the core of, of the work that we're doing in, in my group. So the idea is to have uh, uh, an absorber material, maybe a top absorber and a bottom absorber. I'll, I'll get to that in a minute. You simply put it in water, you put some catalysts on both sides, and, and then you split water uh, under sunlight. Uh, and that's, of course, conceptually much easier and much simpler uh, and potentially also much cheaper than, than this kind of complicated system. The only challenge, and I have to be honest there, uh, of course, if you do this, you have to collect sunlight over the large areas, right? So you basically couple the area where you absorb the light to the electrochemical active area. And, and that might also uh, uh, present some challenges and uh, also increase, actually, the balance of systems cost. So that's... That's um, uh, something we have to think about. What is certainly good about this approach is that the current density that you have is about 100 times lower than in commercial electrolyzers. So we're typically talking about the current density here corresponds to the solar current density, which is in the order of 10 to 20 milliamps per square centimeter instead of the I don't know, 0.5 or up to 2 amps per square centimeter you have for commercial electrolyzers. And that might just enable you to use earth abundant catalysts that, that you can really scale to a, to a terawatt scale. And the other big advantage, of course, is that the heat, that uh, there are also absorbers here, and they also heat up when, when sunlight is absorbed. But here, there's a very close contact between the absorber and the catalyst. So the heat is very easily used to accelerate the, the reactions. And vice versa, also the water that you have here can also be thought to cool the absorber and therefore uh, avoid the efficiency losses that you have when, when heating up a, a normal uh, solar cell. So, so there are some, some reasonable arguments to try and, uh, and, and do this. And then if you want to take it a step further, you can maybe even directly use the hydrogen that you produce. Maybe you don't have to collect that separately. Maybe there's some way with either uh, I don't know, molecular or biological systems to maybe combine that with CO2 and to produce a hydrocarbon fuel all in the same device by, by coupling different catalytic processes. But I, I won't say much about that, but that's, that's an interesting thing to keep in mind for future applications. Well, if, if you want to drive electrochemical reactions, you have to look at what you want to reduce and what you want to oxidize. I think that's nothing new, right? So, and, and the interesting thing from this is that all the reduction reactions of interest are all at about the same potential range. They're all at around zero volts versus RHE, uh, slightly below that. And the oxidation reaction, usually we, we prefer, of course, to oxidize water. That's the most abundant product. And the, the easiest reaction is just oxygen production. So if you subtract these potentials, it turns out, and if you ac uh, account for over potentials, you need a voltage in total of about, let's say, at least one and a half volts, maybe up to two volts. And commercial electrolyzers indeed work at about two volts. Now, that is very difficult to get with a single light absorber. And for that reason, we have to, and I think there's 
There's nowadays a more or less universal agreement in the field that if you want to make an efficient um, uh, solar fuels device to, to produce hydrogen uh, with sunlight, you need to have at least two absorber materials. So, um, and, and if you then, uh, there, there's, you can easily do some calculations and it turns out that something like silicon would be a, a, an almost ideal bottom absorber. And then what we're missing at the moment is a, a stable and efficient top absorber. So that you, uh, that's the absorber that is uh, directed towards the sunlight where the light is absorbed first. And that should have a band gap of about, uh, let's say 1.8 electron volts would be ideal. And such an absorber, 1.8 electron volt band gap with silicon would then give you a pathway towards solar to hydrogen efficiencies of uh, up to 20% if you do everything right and if you can minimize all the losses. So that's something that we're trying to do. Okay, so what, what is of interest then is that usually in most configurations, it's not necessarily always the case, but in most configurations, this top absorber is then in direct contact with the electrolyte. So we are interested in understanding what happens at the semiconductor electrolyte interface. And we've seen in the previous talks uh, the, today, uh, the, the previous speaker, but also earlier this week, uh, already many uh, examples and, and many band diagrams. So I don't have to spend much time on this. I just want to remind you, that the actual work, the electrochemical work that be done, that can be done is, is given by the splitting of the quasi Fermi levels at the surface of the semiconductor. That gives you your driving force for the electrochemical reaction. And in this case, this is the optimistic uh, picture. So here I show that, that one absorber can basically do the entire water splitting process. In practice, that's not the case. Usually this absorber at the, at, uh, uh, at the surface can only oxidize water to form oxygen. And then typically in a tandem cell device, we have another absorber that we place at the back here and that boosts the energy of the electrons a little bit more. And that then can do the hydrogen evolution reaction. All right, what we've also shown, uh, seen yesterday, uh, what we learned from the talk from uh, Anja Bibeler, for instance, and also some other speakers mentioned it, is that um, uh, uh, this looks uh, simple, but uh, in real life, these solid liquid interfaces are, pretty complicated, right? And, and one of the issues is these, these surface states that you can have, right? Surface states can be bad. Uh, they can act as recombination centers for the charges. So for instance, they can capture a hole and then subsequently capture an electron and then act as a recombination center. But they might also act as intermediate electronic states that are involved in the charge transfer process. And then they're a, a good thing to have. Okay, so in... That was sort of an introduction. Uh, what we do in my group, uh, we have uh, different main topics. Uh, so one of our biggest topics is to develop new light absorbers. Uh, so we're working on all, all kinds of oxides that absorb visible light. Usually they're complex oxides with, with two or more metals. Um, and we're trying to uh, make thin films out of these and see how stable they are, how uh, large the photocurrents and the photovoltages are that they, that they give and try to optimize the materials uh, chemistry. So we do thin film deposition, like pulse laser deposition, atomic layer deposition, sputtering, all these things. Uh, and then our, our main characterization technique is photoelectrochemical measurements. So illuminate the sample, measure the current as a function of applied voltage and so on. But we also do uh, ultra fast uh, spectroscopy. So uh, James Durant earlier this week uh, gave a very nice overview of that. Uh, he mostly uses optical spectroscopy. Uh, what we do mostly, uh, we look at the same time scale, so from femtoseconds basically to, to milliseconds if necessary, but we mostly look at uh, the electrons themselves, at the, at, the, at the carriers themselves. So we use techniques like time-resolved microwave conductivity and uh, terahertz uh, spectroscopy. Um, we also do a, a lot of surface and interface phase chemistry of solid liquid interfaces, and that will be the main topic of my talk today. And then we also have a, a more recent activity where we develop uh, real tandem devices and also think about scale up. So do we really photoelectrochemical engineering? Because we've learned that it's one thing to make a nice demonstrator device at uh, less than a square centimeter. That's what almost everybody is doing in the literature, and you can report some nice efficiencies. But putting this in a, in a real device with an area of, let's say, 50 square centimeters, uh, that's a whole other business. And you need to worry about things like mass transport and shadowing and, and bubbles and all these kind of things. But I won't, won't talk about that today. So in the past, uh, we have uh, uh, published at least two of these uh, uh, real integrated uh, 
water splitting devices. So these are two of our highest efficiency devices. One is a 5.2% solar to hydrogen efficiency device that is based on a top absorber of bismuth vanadate. Uh, it's a yellow colored material and a bottom absorber of a double junction of amorphous silicon. And this double junction gives them an extra bit of voltage and together this device splits water with a 5% with a efficiency. Um, a few years later, in collaboration with the Korean group, uh, Jason Lee, uh, we supplied the bismuth vanadate for this and they make this iron oxide. So this is actually a triple junction, a triple absorber. So first part, the high energy photons are absorbed by the bismuth vanadate, slightly lower energy for, uh, uh, photons by the iron oxide. And then the really what's left over after that is uh, just um, uh, absorbed by a normal silicon solar cell. And that gave us then close to 8% solar to hydrogen efficiency, which was one of the highest values, as far as I know, still for, for an oxide-based uh, device. Um, how did we get to this point? So especially here, right? This was not so easy to make this bismuth vanadate in such a way that it, was, um, uh, that it gave us those kind of photocurrents. We had to do a couple of tricks to do that, and I'll, um, uh, I'll, I'll discuss them in a minute. So, I want to also show now at this point uh, the outline of the rest of my talk. So we, uh, I will start with uh, discussing uh, the, what we've learned about the chemical nature of some of the surface states that we, that we see in bismuth vanadate. Then we'll look at uh, the changes at the bismuth vanadate electrolyte interface that we study with uh, uh, ambient pressure XPS. And then at the end, uh, I'll talk about the, the droplet trains. Okay, so one of the things we had to do to uh, uh, optimize our initial bismuth vanadate uh, already uh, many years ago was we had to deposit uh, an oxygen evolution catalyst on the surface because the intrinsic activity of the bismuth vanadate uh, seemed to be quite low and it didn't give us the photocurrents that we wanted. So we used this, uh, this co-PI, this cobalt phosphate catalyst that was reported um, uh, at that time quite recently by, uh, by the Nocera group, the Nocera's group uh, at that time at MIT, um, published in Science. Uh, and this is this nice cubic-like uh, cobalt phosphate structure. So we, we simply electro-deposited that on our bismuth vanadate, and we see this, this is the, the increase in photocurrent. So if you turn on the light with the copy catalyst, you get about five times higher photocurrents than without the copy catalyst. So that was a very nice result. That, that was one of the things that allowed us to, to get to the 5% efficiency. But, but one of the things bothered us, and, and, and that is that we also tried to use a traditional oxygen evolution catalyst, in this case, a ruthenium oxide. And one of the things we measured that a long time ago, but we didn't really understand is if we took bare bismuth vanadate and put the ruthenium oxide on it, it actually decreased the efficiency. And this was not due to, uh, uh, let's say, uh, because we made the layer too thick and uh, it, it absorbed a lot of the light. Uh, it was simply, yeah, we, we just didn't understand. It just really gave us a much lower photocurrent. And then a few years uh, later, so I, I described in this paper over here uh, from 2017, we learned that actually uh, the, the cobalt phosphate has a different role on the bismuth vanadate than we expected. Uh, so it turns out we, we used a technique called uh, intensity modulated photocurrent spectroscopy. And with this technique, we could distinguish between recombination currents in our material and charge transfer currents. And it turns out that uh, if we have bare bismuth vanadate, so without the cobalt phosphate, uh, there's a lot of recombination happening at the surface uh, via some kind of unknown surface state. Um, and then if we put the cobalt phosphate on there, we saw a clear shift. Uh, we saw that no longer the recombination pathway was the dominant one, it was the charge transfer pathway. So what seemed to be the case here is that the cobalt phosphate, the main role of the cobalt phosphate on bismuth vanadate is actually to passivate these surface defects that, that cause recombination. That is not to say that the cobalt phosphate isn't acting as an oxygen evolution catalyst. We actually think it is. But the main reason why it improved the performance of, of bismuth vanadate in particular is it because it passivated the, the defect states. Well, that was a nice result, and that, that helped us understand things a little bit better. But, um, you know, we, we, we fell into the usual trap that everybody working on photoelectrochemistry does, right? You see that something doesn't work well, and you blame it on surface states. That's basically the standard reaction that every photoelectrochemist does. You know, stick a semiconductor in water, see it doesn't work, and blame the surface states. And that's a little bit unsatisfying, of course. We really want to understand what those surface states are. We can see them. We also saw that in the talk of Anya Bibeli yesterday. We can, we can measure them. We can even determine their energy level. We can determine their, their surface density and so on. 
but, but really understanding the chemical nature of that state is, is a tricky thing. So we wanted to get more insight in that. And in order to do that, we used uh, a bismuth van single crystals. So at that time, we had a collaboration with the Institute for Kristallzichting, so the Institute for Crystal Growth in Berlin. And these guys were able to make a really nice uh, undoped and, and molybdenum doped bismuth van single crystals. Um, they're, they're actually not uh, single crystals, they're polycrystalline crystals but the individual crystal domains are relatively large. So we don't have a lot of grain boundaries in between there. We uh, then were able to cleave these crystals and, and make nice lead patterns. So we, we know we have a, a pretty well-defined uh, uh, surface of this mutanidate. And if you want to really learn about surface state, uh, using a single crystal and having a very well-defined uh, surface is a, I would say a, a pretty good place to start. And this was work uh, really done by uh, the, the team that we have, uh, Marco Favaro and David Starr. They're our surface chemistry team, and uh, they, uh, they did a lot of this work. Um, so we first, uh, what we did first is to do the um, uh, valence band XPS spectra. So we took the 1% one uh, 1 molybdenum dope bismuth vanadate and, and recorded valence band spectra. So here you see the valence band edge. And of course, we were a little bit naive. We had hoped to immediately some, some kind of surface state in the band gap. And of course, we, we didn't see anything, right? So the thing is that that doesn't tell you much, right? Uh, because you, you don't know if, if, if the surface state is really not there or whether you just don't see it uh, because the surface state concentrations can be really low, right? So they, they are known to affect behavior uh, even at, at densities of uh, 10 to the 12 per, per square centimeter, right? Which is uh, only a fraction of a monolayer. So you, you can't possibly hope to see that with a technique uh, uh, like XPS if you don't do anything special. So we thought about this and uh, we figured uh, one way to try and enhance the surface state is to do resonant photoemission spectroscopy. And I'll, I'll try to explain how that works. No, it doesn't seem to, yeah, now it goes to the next page. Uh, okay, so in, in normal valence band spectroscopy, what you do is you have an incident photon, an X-ray photon, and you excite uh, a species in the valence band directly to, to the vacuum, and you measure the, the energy that you have there. And normally that, that excitation is not very element specific, right? So any en uh, uh, energy uh, level here that's occupied will be emitted with different capture cross sections, but still there's no element specificity in there. What you now can do, you can also do an excitation in the, in the valence band in the LH region of, for instance, vanadium. Um, so you can do, uh, by tuning the energy of the incident photon, you can make a, a resonant excitation from a vanadium 2P state to a vanadium 3D state. And what happens then is that that electron can recombine with the core hole again. And if that happens, we get an Auger emission uh, uh, from another state. But now the interesting thing is that this Auger emission is much more likely uh, if it comes, uh, uh, if the electron that is excited is resides in the same atom as where you have the original absorption, right? So the Auger emission from a vanadium uh, is something that, that would have a much larger uh, uh, intensity over here. So this resonant photo emission can be used to, to enhance certain features in the valence band that are associated with specific elements by, by doing this uh, uh, resonant emission. So if you want to then do this, you have to understand a, a little bit the electronic structure of the bismuth vanadate. So this is an attempt of, uh, that we made uh, based um, also on a lot of literature data to try and make some sense of it. So we start, of course, with the atomic orbitals of the, of the oxygen, the vanadium, and the bismuth. And then we can make a bonding and anti-bonding combinations in a molecular orbital diagram. And we can try to correlate that on real measured values. So these are, uh, this is a combination of uh, valence band photoelectron spectra in the lower energy regime. So this is the valence band density of states. And then we can also probe the conduction band by doing a, a Nexoff experiment. So X-ray absorption, so um, that's over here. And, and here you can see the different contributions from the different hybrid states over here. And what we can now do is we can do a, a photo emission into one of the, from one of the core levels of, for instance, vanadium in this case, into one of these states here, and then see how that affects the ejection of a lower lying valence band electron, uh, an Auger emission into, into the vacuum. And 
next slide. Oh, I have trouble going to the next slide. Ah, there it goes. All right, and this is then a, an example of the of the spectra that you can see. So this is then the the energy of the uh, of the valence band. Uh, oh, sorry, of the of the uh, L three edges, uh, and this is the binding energy. So on on this scale, this is the energy of the electron or of the photon that we uh, that we put onto the system. Right, so this is uh, the, the the core excitation in the vanadium atoms, the LH atoms, and this is then the binding energy. And to make a, a long story short, if we choose a, 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 an incident photon energy of 514 electron volts, so that is not that is a non-resonant excitation over here, we basically just see the valence band edge, and we see no states over here. But if we then tweak the energy to go to, uh, if I remember, 517.4 eV, so that's somewhere over here then we get all of a sudden this state over here. And this state is now a, a resonant state, uh, uh, an electron occupied, a filled energy state in the, uh, in the band gap of the material above the, the valence band maximum. So this is the valence band maximum, this is the Fermi energy, and this is then the, the energy of that state. And to make a, a long story short, we're pretty confident where that state comes from. It's uh, the, the resonant uh, uh, absorption, so to speak, we, uh, at 517.4 is not really intrinsic to the bismuth vanadate, but we did these experiments on molybdenum doped samples. And the molybdenum is a, a six valent dopant, um, and it substitutes for the vanadium. This is something that we could uh, clearly see. So we have ML4 tetrahedra in the system, and that molybdenum brings an extra electron with it, and that electron is localized or will localize on a vanadium on the neighboring vanadium five plus species. And with that, it forms a vanadium four plus species. And, and that electron is pretty well localized here. So it forms a small polar uh, and, and that in turn induces a distortion of this vanadium uh, O4 tetrahedron. And that distortion is the resonant state that we excite here in this uh, uh, resonant uh, photo emission spectrum. And the response that we see, we can just correlate that uh, in the UV of a, a VO4 species where the vanadium is reduced to a four plus state by the electron that comes from the molybdenum dopant. And the energy level of that state is about one and a half EV below the, the Fermi level. So it's about 0.8 EV above the, above the valence band maximum. Well, that's described in this paper. What's not shown in this paper is that we also uh, exposed uh, the material to water, to uh, uh, I think one, probably less than one molar layer of water. So we expose it to 0.05 tors of H2O. Um, and then we see a, a shift of this back. So we see a broader peak and we could resolve that in two peaks. And that is actually this state over here. So it's a little bit closer to the valence band maximum. And this we assign to uh, a vanadium tetrahedron at the surface that is now terminated with OH groups instead of just pure oxygen. Uh, and that's uh, how we get to that is uh, th this is something we suspected. We've worked together with uh, the, the, Julia, the group of Julia Galli in, uh, in Chicago. And she did, the, they and her team, uh, I don't have time to show that today, but they did some calculations that indeed confirm that this is a, a very likely uh, mechanism that, uh, that takes place. So that, that's great. We now have two candidates for surface states in, uh, uh, bismuth vanadate. Um, uh, they're related to vanadium, so we have a, a good understanding of the nature of those surface states. But to be honest, we, we don't really understand yet how this now affects the PC performance, because doing PC measurements on these kind of uh, rather thick uh, single crystals that are also not super nicely conducting, that, that is not an easy thing, right? But at least we now have an idea of what kind of chemical surface state could form at the surface. And, and how it could change even in terms of energy when you when you expose it to, to water. That's also again something interesting, right? It also illustrates really that the pressure gap we always have in catalysis, right? So a single crystal in UHV gives you different surface states than a single crystal that you put in water, right? So the electronic structure of the sample really changes. And that, of course, no, not a surprise, but it's it's good to remind ourselves so once in a while that this is indeed uh, changing the picture. Okay, so the single crystal uh, stuff is nice, but uh, we want to get back to a more realistic uh, uh, sample and, and realistic conditions. So that will be the next part of the talk. So we wanted to do uh, XPS measurements on real electrode materials. 
And this is something that you can do with the so-called dip and pull technique uh, that was developed in, uh, in, in Berkeley by uh, Miguel Samaron and, and others. Uh, and what you do here is you, you have uh, a sample holder here with a counter electrode and a working electrode, a reference electrode. You dip this in a beaker of water, you pull it up and then you have a meniscus over here. And if you position your XPS analyzer now in the right place, you might be able to find a region of water where the water layer is really thin and where you're able to get photo emitted electrons, where you're able to detect photo emitted electrons from the sample through the water layer into the analyzer. So in order to do that, uh, if, you, if you put a beaker of water in a chamber, then at room temperature, that gives you a vapor pressure of about uh, 20 uh, millibars of, uh, of water vapor. And of course, your XPS analyzer doesn't like that, so you have to differentially pump this. And uh, these are now commercial systems that you can buy, right? So we, we have one of these systems, uh, um, Specs uh, and Sienta both have ambient pressure uh, uh, electron analyzers. Um, so, the electrons need to be able to travel through a thin layer of water. That's a few tens of, of nanometers. And in order to be able to do that, you, you need to have high energy photons, right? So with low energy photons, uh, soft X-ray photons, no chance. They really need to have, let's say, energies in the range of uh, above two kilo electron volts. And for that, of course, uh, you need to have a synchrotron to do that. Yeah, so um, uh, at that time, this is already a few years ago, uh, uh, Marco and David went to, uh, to the ALS uh, at Beamline 931, uh, the team of Ethan Crumlin. They had developed something uh, like this, and, and this is then a picture that you see here. So you have the analyzer nozzle over here, you have the working electrode, you see the, the water uh, interface here, and you see that the analyzer nozzle is a, a few millimeters or maybe even a centimeter above, above the water. So the nice thing is that you can use this technique also for non-single crystals. So these are just spray deposited samples. This, are, this spray deposition is basically just airbrushing a bismuth vanadate solution onto a heated substrate plate. So they're very, I would say, compared to a single crystal, these are very messy electrodes, but they work. They give very high photocurrents up, up and beyond uh, three milliamps per square centimeter. And we just dip them in here and then uh, measure that. The electrolyte that we have is 0.1 molar of potassium phosphate. Uh, and maybe just as an interesting aside, you can calculate the bias screening length. That's about one nanometer in a 0.1 molar solution. So that basically tells you that if you have, uh, if you go well beyond one nanometer in the electrolyte layer thickness, the electrolyte really behaves as a bulk electrolyte. So there's no funny constrained electrolytes uh, effects over here. All right, then immediately to some of the results that we got. So uh, this here shows the option 1S spectrum. This is in the dark when we start. We recognize the, the water, uh, the oxygen signal from water in the gas phase, the water in the liquid phase. We have here the, the oxygen in the, uh, in the bismuth vanadate bulk phase. And we have a, a species here that, uh, uh, that basically can be due to an OH species or to the hydrogen, uh, the oxygen in the hydrogen phosphate that we have in the electrolyte. Now, if we, this is in the dark, if we then illuminate the sample with a, a solar simulator via a, a, an optical fiber, we see an increase in this signal. This goes up quite a bit. And if we make it dark again, it goes back again. So we clearly see a reversible change here. And we also looked at, um, uh, oh no, before I go there, yeah, one, a few other things that you can do if you do a very careful analysis of the of the ratio of, for instance, this liquid water peak to the, the bismuth vanadate peak, you can actually, and if you do some calibrations, you can actually determine the electrolyte layer of thickness, which in this case was in the order of 20 nanometers. And you can actually determine that, that quite accurately. Uh, so we know we have a 20 nanometer layer uh, of electrolyte uh, in between the, the bismuth vanadate and the, and the nozzle, the gas phase. Okay, so back to this peak here that we see increase could be either OH or, or a PO4 uh, peak. And then we looked also at the bismuth 4F peaks and we also see a shoulder over here, right? So there's no shift in the peak, but there's a, a shoulder developing under illumination. And if we make it dark again, it's, it, it goes away. And to make a long story short, uh, that is basically consistent with the formation of bismuth phosphate. Uh, so what we have here is the formation of a very thin uh, bismuth phosphate layer on top of the um, uh, 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 of the bismuth vanadate. 
Okay, so how, how can we now try to explain this? And this is, this is not easy. This is somewhat speculative, I have to warn you, but it, it, it describes uh, the, the observations that we see in the XPS spectrum. So what we think is happening, so we, we start out with a bismuth vanadate layer. We have the electrolyte phase over here. This is all in the dark. And if we then illuminate the sample, what we think happens is that protons leave the surface and then are buffered by the, by the potassium phosphate buffer. And that explains the increase in the H2PO4 versus HPO4 ratio. And that's something that we measured uh, with IR measurements at another beam line over here. So if you see here, uh, the blue curve is in the dark. And if we then illuminate it, we see a decrease in the HPO4 and we see an increase in the H2PO4. And that's consistent with protons leaving the surface and being buffered uh, by this. Then the next step, what we think happens is that phosphate groups from the electrolyte, they specifically adsorb at the surface. And that would also explain the negative charging. So we see a change in the open circuit potential of the sample, uh, which, we, which we measure uh, of about minus 30 milli electron volts. So we know that the surface becomes slightly negatively charged. And then we think what happens is that uh, as a result of that, other phosphate groups are repelled from the bismuth vanadate electrolyte interface to a region closer to the electrolyte vapor interface, uh, which is 20 nanometers uh, upstream, so to speak. And that would explain the increase in the HXPO4 signal that we saw on the previous slide. So it's a little bit tentative, but it gives some feeling for what, what, what could happen. And what's interesting uh, to note, uh, uh, yeah, and so th this is then the layer that you see over here. If you illuminate it, this is the bismuth phosphate layer that you form at the surface of the, uh, of the material. And again, I emphasize that these changes are, are reversible. You can also look at uh, the time evolution of how the peak ratios of the different peak changes. And, and we see that, for instance, if we look at uh, uh, the HPO4 over H2O ratio, uh, that's this one over here that changes over a time span of about five minutes. And it relaxes back when we make it dark again over a slightly longer time scale. And, and this is such a long time scale that uh, this cannot be any direct electronic process. It has to do with some kind of chemical transformation of the surface that we, that we see. So the question is a little bit, what does this bismuth, validate, uh, sorry, bismuth, bismuth phosphate layer uh, really do? Um, and to do that, uh, well, we were again looking at maybe we thought uh, there might be a surface state over there, right? So what we did is, uh, this is work by Marco Favaro. So what he did was he, he looked at a certain potential range and in a very narrow region in a potential range made very fast back and forth uh, uh, current voltage sweeps. And what we see here is uh, basically the, the magnitude of this sweep and it depends on the, on the scan rate and that gives you a measure, uh, it gives you a way to measure the capacitance of the sample at that particular potential. And if you then plot the capacitance over here, as shown over here, what you see here is that in the dark, uh, those are the, the, the filter triangles, uh, we see a clear evidence of a, a peak in the capacitance of the presence of a surface state. If we illuminate the sample, it goes away. And if we make it uh, uh, dark again, the surface state comes back. So there's a capacitance peak at about 0.8 volt versus RHC that, that seems to indicate the presence of this surface state. Um, and then um, what happens is it, it disappears under illumination. So, and, and under illumination, we also know that we get this bismuth phosphate layer. So it seems to passivate the surface state, right? So maybe we thought there's maybe a similar role as the cobalt phosphate that I shown earlier. Maybe the bismuth phosphate simply passivates surface states. Uh, and that could also explain some other behavior and phenomena that have been reported in the literature. So uh, maybe to summarize uh, what we understood at that point is uh, we could also estimate the thickness of the bismuth phosphate layer. It's very thin, right? Um, uh, mechanism of formation is a, a bit unclear. It's, we think actually now it's, it's photo corrosion followed by precipitation of bismuth phosphate. That would also explain that it's a self-limiting growth mechanism, right? I mean, the more you grow it, the less there can be of the underlying bismuth vanadate can dissolve. So you would have a self-limiting growth of this uh, layer by, by reprecipitation. Uh, the material itself, the bismuth phosphate is actually transparent, optically transparent. So it block, doesn't block the light. So it's not bad to have it there. And there are in fact indications in the literature, other papers that show that uh, uh, this kind of junction between bismuth phosphate and bismuth vanadate actually appears to you know, have some favorable uh, photocatalytic uh, properties. All right, so that was uh, work that we've done at, uh, at the ALS uh, a few years ago. And we were so excited about this and we were so uh, intrigued by all the new insights that we got 
is that we also decided to uh, develop this activity in Berlin uh, at our busy uh, synchrotron. Uh, and that's part of a longer story. So we worked together with the Fritz Haber Institute, which is the Institute of uh, Professor Schlegel, who you heard uh, earlier this week on, on Monday. And we have, uh, are now building up this uh, uh, Berlin Joint Lab for Electrochemical Interfaces. So this is planned to look like this. So we have uh, three beam lines over here. There's the ISIS hutch that is operated by the Fritz Haber people. We have our beam line where, that we uh, are building up and, and, and currently uh, that we will operate. And then we have another soft X-ray beam line over here, uh, plus a chemistry uh, preparation lab. So this is all being planned. It's a very long story, but we hope that to have this hutch built by the summer shutdown of, uh, of next year. Uh, and then of course, everyone can, can use it. Um, slide. All right, so a little bit more about uh, the end station that we want to operate. We've actually built it already. It's based on the modular concept. Uh, this modular concept was also uh, uh, conceived by the Fritz Haber Institute. Uh, uh, so we follow basically their, uh, their, their recipe for, for making such a modular system. So one module here, the red one, is the, the XPS analyzer itself with the differential pumping. And then we can put different modules in front of it. And the one uh, module that we've built is the dip and pull, um, uh, which I'll discuss in a minute. And then later I'll show you the droplet train module. So what happens in this chamber with the dip and pull is, uh, this is a photograph what happens. So this is where the X-rays from the synchrotron come from. This yellow is the, the, the bismuth van rate sample. This is the analyzer. And this is the beaker of, uh, of water. So uh, we, we basically dip the sample in here. We, position the analyzer closer. So the, the X-rays come in at a near glancing angle and the photo, photo emitted electrons are detected at uh, almost normal to the, to the surface. And this whole UHV chamber is of course uh, uh, in, in equilibrium with water at room temperature. So there's a background vapor pressure of, of 20 millibars of water. And the team that, that operates this and did a lot of experiments with that is shown over here. So David and, and Marco uh, are permanent staff members in, in my group and uh, they run this effort and, and here is uh, the postdocs that they work with. Uh, two of them have, have already left, Pip and Michael, but Rosella and, and Marilyn are, are still there. Okay, so the analyzer is a, an analyzer that can go up to 10 keV. Uh, we can have uh, uh, images uh, resolution better than 20 micrometers uh, at this uh, energy range and we can go basically from slightly over 200, uh, sorry, 2 keV to about uh, 8 keV with, uh, with the beam lines that we're operating this in. So as I mentioned before, the, the hutch that we have uh, that we will build for Belkem is not ready yet. So we're currently doing these experiments on another beam line. This is the KMC1 beam line at, at Bessie. And here you see the system. You recognize the analyzer. And then over here is all the, the stuff that we need to, to drop the sample. And it's the, the, uh, the dip and pull margin that we have over here. Okay. so. When that end station was ready, we decided to revisit the work that we've done before at, uh, at Berkeley with, uh, with the bismuth vanadate samples. And we basically had a closer look at two of these samples. One with, with the old recipe that we had, where we annealed the samples after spray deposition at 450 degrees C, and then one that we annealed at, at higher temperatures. So we see here for uh, uh, this sample that at the lower temperatures, we see a little bit uh, less regular surface structure. Uh, I would say a combination of smaller and larger grains. And only when you kneel at 500 degrees, you get, I would say, some of the pictures that you also see in the literature with, uh, I would say, a more regular bismuth uh, structure. So that's what those samples look like. So they look pretty messy, but, but this one looks slightly more nice than, <laughs> than this one, perhaps. Uh, so we first, uh, yeah, so and, and we, did, we repeated the, dip, the dip and pull measurements. Um, Next slide. Uh, and, and we started out by uh, just looking at the stoichiometry of the surface. So this is not dip and pull yet. This is just looking at the, the bismuth to vanadium atomic ratio at the surface uh, as a function of probe depth. So basically as a function of uh, 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 photon energy that we put in here. And one of the things to note here is that for sample A, that was annealed at lower temperatures, we actually see a, a dip in the bismuth to vanadium ratio. So in other words, this is a vanadium rich surface that we have for these, I would say, imperfectly annealed samples. And when we anneal it at 500 degrees, we see that uh, the stoichiometry uh, is, I would say, more repaired. They're no longer uh, vanadium rich. They even seem to be a little bit bismuth uh, rich. 
Now, the question is, how, how, is that, how does that affect the, the, the local bonding at the, at the surface of these vanadium-rich films? So we looked uh, at that with uh, X-ray absorption uh, measurements. Um, so we made sure that the penetration depth of these measurements was the same as we, we do for actual uh, XPS measurements to, to really have a, a result that we can compare. And here you see the comparison of the two of the two samples. Sample A, the blue one, annealed at 450, and sample B, the green one, annealed at 500 degrees. And you see some differences in the spectrum, and you see that there where there's a, a, a positive difference of the annealed sample, there seems to be more, uh, uh, seems to be more related to a vanadium uh, uh, oxide layer. Uh, and to make, uh, again, a long story short, we uh, did a linear combination uh, of these signals to try and get a, a, a better match. And then we figured out that um, uh, uh, what happens probably is that part of the vanadium oxide segregates out in sample A, right? So in the imperfectly annealed sample, we have some vanadium oxide segregated out uh, at the surface, and that gives us the vanadium rich signals. And indeed, if you do this linear combination, you see indeed a, a much, uh, a quite nice fit of the, of the spectrum. Okay, now the interesting stuff, right? So we did uh, the experiments in the uh, in the electrolyte. We tried to repeat the experiments that we've done at, uh, at Berkeley uh, a few years ago. And then here we were happy actually to be able to reproduce also the change in this uh, uh, in the bismuth 4F signal, right? So I don't show the oxygen, but I just saw the, the bismuth. And we see here the shoulder here. We cannot fit this any other way than with the shoulder. And that is indeed indicative of the bismuth phosphate. Uh, that we formed. So that's entirely consistent what we saw, what we saw before. Now, the interesting thing is that if we look at the sample that was annealed at much higher temperatures, we, we don't see this, right? We don't see the shoulder anymore. And in fact, I can tell you, we don't have any bismuth phosphate that is being formed under these conditions. So the bismuth phosphate only forms for these, I would say, poorly annealed samples, and it doesn't form for these uh, nicely annealed uh, samples. What we do see here is a shift in the peak. We, we don't see that here. So here the bands do not change. There's no band flattening in this case when the bismuth phosphate forms. But here we do see a shift and we see a flattening of about 0.3 electron volts, which corresponds to more or less complete uh, band flattening of the, of the material at the surface. So have another look at these surface states. Uh, again, we were happy to be able to reproduce these uh, surface states for the uh, for basically the, the old sample under the old annealing conditions, that uh, imperfect. But we also saw this surface state and, and the disappearance of the surface state under light and its reappearance again uh, for the sample at which there is no bismuth phosphate, right? So we know we don't have any bismuth phosphate, uh, but we do see passivation of the surface state. So the only conclusion that we can draw from that is that, and that is different from our earlier conclusion, is that it's, it's this, whatever this bismuth phosphate does, it, it is not the thing that, that passivates these surface states because the passivation also occurs when there's no bismuth phosphate, right? So it seems to be an unrelated phenomenon, uh, which was a little bit disappointing, but uh, yeah, that's what it is. Okay, so we find that uh, it only forms on non-perfect surfaces uh, and there are some explanations for that, right? So uh, certainly the, the less perfectly annealed samples are partially amorphous also, so they might easier, more easily dissolve and then re-precipitate. Uh, we also saw that they're vanadium rich. That also means they might dissolve and, and re-precipitate. Uh, and we think also because of some of the leaching of the, the vanadium oxide, uh, the VO4, groups uh, that might actually leave reactive bismuth three plus surface sites that can bind the phosphates from the electrolyte quite easy. And that might also cause the bismuth phosphate uh, uh, formation. Uh, but this is actually a quite complicated story, right? We've also seen uh, Francesca Stoma's talk uh, earlier this week, and she did a lot of work also on understanding the corrosion uh, mechanism. So she found, for instance, in her very nice 2016 paper that bismuth and vanadium uh, dissolve in the, in the same ratio uh, and that the rate of dissolution depends, uh, well, partly on pH, but also on the, the strength of the electrolytes. We saw in a, in a later paper uh, that came out last year, uh, we saw also that the type of electrolyte that we have, this was work we've done in collaboration with Carl Meyerhofer and Christina Scheu uh, here in Germany. We saw that also the type of electrolyte, whether we use a borate, a phosphate or a citrate also gives us different dissolution behavior of the different uh, species, so the vanadium species and the, the bismuth species. 
so it, it, it's quite a complicated story to really understand uh, the dissolution. So the, the good news is, however, if you make your bismuth vanadate in exactly the right way and you make sure it's crystallized, uh, you can get uh, uh, stabilities of operation of uh, over a thousand hours. Uh, so that was published by, for instance, the Doman Group in Japan and also Kim Shin Choi uh, at the University of Wisconsin-Madison. They both published papers one year after each other where they showed really exceptionally stable bismuth vanadate behavior uh, for samples that were really made in the right way. So they don't, they don't suffer from all this dissolution behavior, at least not, not to the extent that we, that we and Francesca could, could show here. Mm -hmm. All right, a few words on uh, uh, how does this now affect uh, the photoelectric chemical response, right? So first of all, if you measure the open circuit potential, so basically you measure the Fermi level of the bismuth vanadate, you see for the imperfectly annealed samples, if you turn on the light, the Fermi level drops down, but it, it slowly goes back to its equilibrium situation. And if you turn the light off, relaxes again. So, but th this is basically not so favorable, right? There's no persistent change any change in the OCP seems to re relax back to its initial value. And that's basically, you, you cannot directly correlate open circuit potential to, to real photovoltage that's internally generated. That's, that's a difficult thing to directly measure, uh, but they're also not entirely unrelated. And, and this I would say is a, is a bad sign for a sample producing photovoltage. A much better sign is that what we get for the, the better annealed samples that look more regular. There we really do see if you turn on the light, we see a drop. Uh, uh, in the potential, which means an increase in the Fermi level, so band flattening that we also saw. And then if you turn off the light, this slowly relaxes back, but we see a real uh, uh, OCP uh, developing here. Uh, perhaps more interesting is the photocurrent densities, right? So these are the photocurrent densities for sample A and B. And what's interesting is that if you look at the potential of 1.23 volts, which is sort of, um, I would say uh, 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 often used as a key performance indicator for this material, you see actually that the, the, the steady state photocurrent for these samples is exactly the same. Even though we know that the surface actually behaves very, very differently. So for sample A, we have the bismuth phosphate. For sample B, we don't, but they give us the same photocurrents. And this tells us, and that's, that's also a lesson that we knew already, but it's good to re-emphasize this, is that photocurrent by itself is actually a very poor indicator of photoelectrode quality, right? You, at the very least, you would also have to look at the photovoltage or perhaps as an approximation of that, uh, the OCP and so on, right? So this is a word of, of warning. All right, final few minutes uh, on the liquid uh, droplet trains. Um, uh, uh, liquid droplet trains are often used for studying uh, liquid vapor uh, behavior. What is a liquid droplet train? Well, it, it looks like this, this is a photograph. And these are all little droplets that come out of a nozzle and that fall down, right? Uh, and these droplets are made by putting a, a fluid through a capillary here and a nozzle. And then there's a vibrating element here, a piezoelectric element, and that breaks up these, the stream of liquid that you would normally have into droplets. Well, this, this type of experiment is quite common in, for instance, atmospheric sciences, where they uh, look at gas exchange, uh, uh, solid liquid, uh, uh, solid vapor, uh, sorry, liquid vapor interfaces. Uh, and, and very often this is done with a liquid jet in which they don't break up the jet into droplets, but a liquid stream. Uh, but the problem with liquid jets uh, is that very often uh, they break up, but they always break up due to, to Rayleigh instabilities. What you now can do by, by vibrating this, this, this element over here, you can deliberately break up, you can see that over here, break up the, 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 the liquid jet into a stream of, of droplets. And that's nice. So if you do this in an atmosphere that has uh, that is in equilibrium with water vapor, you can actually um, uh, uh, do XPS measurements on these droplets. Uh, you can put the analyzer very close to these droplets and do XPS measurements uh, under conditions where the droplet is in equilibrium with the environment. Right. So the equilibrium vapor pressure of water at room temperature is about 20 torrs or so, uh, and, and that means that if these droplets come out, they're in an atmosphere of water vapor at 23 degrees C, and that means they're in, in equilibrium with the environment. So it's, it's really equilibrium atmospheric pressure uh, XPS that we do here. You can tune the droplet sign. I will show that more often, uh, uh, sorry, later in the talk. And what's interesting is now that because every time you measure such a droplet, right, the droplet goes down with a speed of a few meters per second. So what's nice about this is that these droplets don't have time 
to form impurities at their surfaces. Because every time an impurity forms because of adsorption from the gas phase, for instance, yeah, you, you measure already the next droplet. It's also nice, uh, a nice way to avoid beam damage, right? Because even if you have such a high photon energy that you, that you would, uh, let's say, uh, evaporate this droplet, you know, no worries. There's another droplet uh, following a, a few milliseconds later. So it's a really nice way to do uh, XPS on, on liquid vapor interfaces. Uh, so David and our group, uh, my group leader in, in this area, he explored this already quite a few years ago when he was a postdoc at, uh, at, uh, at Berkeley. And he uh, built this, this uh, uh, droplet train machine um, and it, it works. Uh, here you see actually a photograph. So this is the nozzle, the XPS nozzle. These are the droplets over here. Uh, and uh, just to give you a feeling for the scale, right? These droplets are in the order of 100 microns, right? And the distance between the droplet and the opening of the nozzle is something like uh, 0.3 millimeters. So it's very, very close. And he often told me stories that uh, this is, these are actually very difficult and frustrating experiments to do because if your droplet train is not so stable, and that was actually the main issue that he struggled with, if your droplet train is not stable, uh, uh, then one of these droplets might hit the nozzle. And then you have a liquid water droplet sucked into your expensive XPS analyzer. And that means you have to stop the experiment, open the analyzer, clean it, put it back, and before you know it, uh, you know, another two days lost. So this is not, these are not easy experiments. What's nice actually, and this I want to, uh, I forgot to mention that in the previous slide, you can position the nozzle of the analyzer at different points uh, 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 below the, the nozzle uh, uh, opening. And that gives you a different time scale, right? So the lower you are, the longer it takes for the droplet to travel from the nozzle for the opening towards the point where, where the analyzer nozzle is. And that means you can use XPS to follow, for instance, chemistry. You can, for instance, uh, uh, put two liquid layers, uh, liquid streams together to try and form a nanoparticle. And then you can see by positioning the analyzers at different points here, you can look at the XPS data of uh, 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 the nanoparticles that are formed at, at different points in, in time by just changing the Z position over here. That's quite interesting. So David, uh, as I said before, uh, David's first attempt uh, more than 10 years ago, uh, stability was a big issue. So he tried to improve that now. And one of the ways to improve that is to use a technique called flow focusing. And that basically means that this is the nozzle over here where your liquid comes through. And now you have another opening under here. And this is a closed volume where you put gas through. So there's a gas pressure difference between here where there's a low pressure of gas and here where there's a high pressure of gas. And you use that gas, the gas flow over here, to focus the, the, the liquid stream of, uh, of your uh, solution that, that goes here. And that gives you a, a big improvement in stability. So David and uh, his uh, postdoc, Pip, uh, they together, they, they built this uh, um, uh, flow focusing uh, liquid droplet train system. So we have here the capillary where the liquid goes through. This is the piezo ring that sort of vibrates and breaks, deliberately breaks up the droplets. And then over here, the gases flow over here at, a, at an overpressure. And this overpressure basically uh, make sure that you focus the liquid flow here in a way that, that in, improves the stability and actually as an added advantage is also reduces the risk of, of clogging. And this is then a photograph. So this is the outer area where the gas flow goes. This is the liquid outlet. This is the nozzle. Liquid comes out. The droplet is focused here. And then underneath here, that's really the opening into the rest of the vacuum chamber where the droplets come out. This is a photograph of what it looks like. Um, so this is uh, illuminated by an LED. Uh, it's, a, it's a fast blinking LED. And the blinking of the LED is synchronized with the, the excitation of the piezoelectric nozzle. So if you would look at this, uh, these droplets seem to, seem, seem to stand still. And this is where they come out. Uh, so of course, the, the image is a little bit tilted. But of course, this beam goes down uh, perpendicular uh, to, to gravity. So it goes down. And this is the analyzer nozzle. And here you can measure the XPS spectra of this uh, droplet. And this is where the X-rays from the synchrotron come from. The X-rays goes over here, photo emits electrons into the analyzer, and then you can measure it. So this is a little movie, and I hope uh, we tested it, but now I don't get the response. So the movie doesn't seem to work. Anyway, it's probably the most boring movie that you will ever see, because if I were able to play it, you wouldn't see any changes. 
<laughs> and that's simply because the, uh, the flashing of the light, the background light, is synchronized with the droplets. So these droplets seem to stand still uh, if you would see the movie. And by doing this in the right way, you can actually position, so to speak, this droplet exactly at, at this point in the nozzle. Uh, and then you can measure the spectra. So a few experiments that we've done, a few commissioning experiments, uh, just to see if we can get any signal from that. Uh, this is a, a series that we measured as a function of incident photon energy. And here you see a two kilo electron volt. Basically, you don't see anything, right? You just see the, the gas phase water peak over here. You don't see the, the liquid phase water. It's too small. But if you go to higher photon energies, then you're able to, for the photo excited electrons to reach the analyzer nozzle, they have enough kinetic energy, and then you see a, a signal over here. So that works, and it also illustrates the need for uh, sufficiently energetic photons. Uh, so you have to have a synchrotron for this. Second experiment is uh, to play with frequency. So by playing with the piezoelectric frequency, you can control the droplet size. You can also play with the flow, the millimeters per minute, and the frequency together determine the droplet size. And here you see, for instance, 220 micrometer diameter droplets spaced a certain distance from each other. And if you play with the frequency, you can reduce the, the droplet size to 155 micrometers, and they are also spaced more closely together. And this, and that's shown in this picture, it's not so interesting, it just tells you basically that in this situation, you get a better uh, ratio of the liquid water to the, to the gas phase water peak of the XPS. So that ratio goes up if the, if the droplets are closer together. And if you think about that, that, that makes sense. So we also have a delay line detector that means that we can temporarily, uh, uh, in, in the time regime, uh, decide when the photo excited electrons are analyzed by the analyzer. Uh, uh, so we can do time correlated experiments. And this is shown over here. So in the, the blue line over here is uh, when we measure only 30% of the time. So 70% of the time we don't detect any photo electrons coming up, but 30% 30, 30 we do. And we have now time synchronized the experiment so that the, the signal that we measure here is measured in between two droplets, right? So this is the 30% that we measure in between two droplets and we only see the gas phase signal. If we now shift that to, uh, if we do the phase shift, now we make sure that we only measure when there's a droplet in front of the analyzer. And there indeed we see that uh, we get the liquid phase signal over there. So we can really do this in a nice way. And this opens up a really nice set of experiments because for instance, what we could do is we could have position a laser upwards, uh, let's say higher in the droplet stream and do maybe a photo excitation on, on a photocatalyst nanoparticle that's dissolved in that droplet. Um, and then we can uh, uh, maybe photo excite uh, 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 every other particle and then measure the differences between a non-excited uh, a droplet and an excited droplet, right? And that allows you to measure different spectra, uh, which goes a long way in really determining uh, what the different photo ex excited uh, uh, excitations, uh, uh, what their result. All right, I, I think I'm almost at the end, so I have to hurry a little bit. Yeah. The final experiment that we did um, uh, is the, uh, I'm almost at the end also, is to put nine nanometer silicon dioxide nanoparticles in the solution. And we try to measure and try to see that. So we see the gas phase water, we see the liquid phase water. We don't see the oxygen from the silicon oxide here. That's just too small a signal, but we can also go to the silicon 1S peak and then we do see the signal. And this was measured uh, uh, by averaging a, a net amount of averaging of about 15 minutes, right? So, and the droplet train is stable for several hours, right? So we can even get much better signal to noise ratios. And since in, this, in such small nanoparticles, a large fraction of the atoms is at the surface, that means also that we will be able to study solid-liquid interfaces with this kind of technique, with this liquid droplet train. So this is what it looks like. This is in the sample. So this is just a liquid droplet train module that we then hooked up to our analyzer. Uh, these are the different uh, parameters. So we can look at droplets between, let's say, 130 and 280 this should, be, this should be micrometers, not nanometers, sorry, just micrometers. Uh, and the time window that we have from the top of the droplet train to the bottom, right, where we, and we can have stable droplet trains up to at least 50 centimeters, is from 250 microseconds to 100 milliseconds. And the droplet train that we've looked at, uh, uh, we can routinely get more than three hours of stability, right? So we can do a lot of 
interesting uh, 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 science with that. All right, and then finally, and it's too bad that this video doesn't work, but at the end of the experiment, basically what you have to do is you have to remove all the water that has accumulated in the bottom of your UHV chamber, and you just have to open the, the tap and then water flows out. Uh, and that's of course something that is, uh, you know, for a surface scientist, it's a very odd idea to tap liquid water from your <laughs> UHV system. All right, ah, now it works. I hope you can see it. So there's liquid water coming out of our very nice UHV system. <laughs> All right, so some final uh, conclusions. Uh, so I think I've shown you that the crystallinity and stoichiometry have a huge influence on the dynamics of the surface. I don't think that's anything new after this exciting week that we've had uh, in this uh, series of seminars, but it's, uh, yeah, it's, it's, it's amazing to see uh, some of the effects that occur. Uh, we could find this very nice uh, 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 with XPS, uh, this two nanometer bismuth phosphate layer. I haven't said that in detail, but to, to be able to see a two nanometer layer that only forms under in the liquid and only under illumination, I would challenge you to do that with any other experimental technique. As far as we know, uh, ambient pressure XPS is one of the very few techniques which put you, uh, with which you can study such uh, films that are formed. Um, I think we also saw, I, I didn't go in that detail about this, but we've seen it in previous talk. Uh, there's a lot of redistribution of ions at the solid semiconductor liquid interface, and, and you can also use this, these now Hux best studies to, to look at them. Um, here, I would say we, we have now a better understanding of some of the, of, the, of the chemical nature of some of the surface states that we see in bismuth vanadate, but the challenge is really to try and correlate this to PC performance, right? Because there are so many things changing, right? We have the materials chemistry itself. That's already difficult to understand. And, and then when you put a material like that in water and all the dynamic changes that you have there, it's, uh, I would say, a very rich, but also very complicated uh, field of study that I think uh, will keep us busy for, for many years. And I hope to show that this liquid droplet train is, is an interesting uh, idea. And then, and next slide. Uh, finally, uh, saturating UHV systems with water is, uh, is not only fun to do, but it's, it's even useful. Okay, many people to thank, especially the, the Spantex team, which is the name of our, of our ambient pressure uh, station. Uh, David Starr and Marco Favaro, they did the bulk of the work, a really fantastic crew. Many others also contributed to this, and uh, thanks also to our collaborators, and, and thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, thanks a lot. And uh, we have, we're running a bit late, so... Yeah, sorry. <laughs> all right. uh, we have two questions from, from the audience. So we'll let Deepak Kumar talk, uh, be able to talk. You should be able to talk now. Hi, Roel. Uh, am I audible? Yeah. Uh, thank you for the nice presentation. So I'm curious, like on slide 15, you have mentioned about the lenses. So. Can you make a comment on the specialty of the lenses you used? Slide 15, you say, huh? So let me see if I can go there. Oh, the electromagnetic lenses, you mean? Yeah. Yeah, yeah so, um, God, I'm, I'm not an expert on that. But, but the idea is, of course, if you collect your photoelectrons through a small nozzle, they, they will go, of course, all the way. Uh, and, and you capture, if, if you wouldn't do anything special, you would capture only a small fraction of them, right? So that's why you use this electromagnetic lens to make sure that you refocus the ion beam and get a, a high enough fraction of the, of the electrons actually into the analyzer. Um, so, so we basically just bought this part from, from specs uh, in this case, right? So they have now developed these electromagnetic lenses in these, uh, in these differential pumping stages they're all integrated and that's just, uh, you can basically just buy them and, uh, and work with this. Does that answer your question? So, so you have used two lenses, right? So uh, can we use one? I mean, instead of two, can we, can it solve the purpose? Uh, probably you can, uh, but to be honest, that that's just depends on the electron optics, right? Apparently, uh, I'm not even sure if in our system, they, they might even use three. I, I'm, I'm not sure uh, whether they use two or three, but, but typically you, you need, different stages to really get from a pressure from 20 millibars to, let's say, ultra high vacuum, right? You, you need at least three stages for that. Yeah. Um, and in every stage, of course, you lose because there's this little capillary, you lose. So in every stage, I think you need a lens. Um, the less lenses you have, yeah, the, the more signal you lose. 
Mm-hmm. So yeah, thank you. Uh, I have one more uh, query. Like uh, in your journal of applied uh, physics D work, I mean, uh, you have shown two types of samples: one in green color and another in the blue, right? Yeah. Uh, so, so that that color is something. I mean, showing some signs, or it is uh, sake for the representation. That sample. Oh yeah, in the green and the blue. So yeah, it is just. So it is just for the sake of representation, you have assigned uh, green and blue color or something, uh, some property you are studying like fluorescent no, or something. <laughs> no, no, no. This is just a random color to make sure that we recognize them, right? And to correlate them to the different uh, to the different curves that we have here. So there, there, there's no physical meaning of the color. <laughs> it's just to distinguish them. So, so uh, this like in the blue color uh, sample, so I can see that these grains, so these are of different sizes, right? But while, while in the green, they are they look uniform so why yeah. is it so like so why is it so like in the uh, blue colored sample you can see there are small and there are big i mean grains I mean, yeah. so can you comment on that i mean uh, yeah i i think that's basically we know for bismuth vanadate if you you know even if you make a perfectly flat layer of bismuth vanadate for instance with a technique called uh, pulse laser deposition right we've also done that yeah. It turns out that if you heat it to a high enough temperature, it always forms these worm-like structures that you see on the right. So it's, it's I would say, almost impossible to make a, a well-crystallized, uh, flat bismuth vanadate layer. They always seem to curl up in these kind of structures. And that just has to do with the mobility of the bismuth also, uh, especially. That just moves all over the place, and, and then you get the formation of these structures. And of course, yeah, depending on, on, on what temperatures and what times and what the original morphology of your film was, yeah, if, if you don't wait long enough to get these structures, yeah, then you get basically a mixture of uh, structures that, that haven't really evolved into their equilibrium state at that particular temperature. So, so is it possible, like, so, as you so, increase... Mark, uh, Mark, wait, wait, wait a second. Oh. Simply many questions to, uh, to allow also other people to ask a question. Oh, okay, okay. Th- thank you, thank you. Yeah. So, uh, Jose Carlos Conesa, uh, please, you, you, can, you can ask a question. Yeah, well... Uh, Hi, Jose. The, the, the question was... Uh, uh, answer is partly in the last of the slide, but in the in any case, uh, Dr. Van der Kroll, uh, how do you envisage adding powder to the droplets? This would require that the liquid layer on the powder is very small. Yeah, so, so that, that's actually a good point, right? So I, I would say that the picture that I showed, right, uh, for the, wait a minute, uh, this picture that I show here is, is a naive picture. It doesn't really work like that, right? It, it, this is kind of the idea that this meniscus, if you position the, the analyzer at the right point, that the meniscus will be thin enough to see it. What actually happens if you put these kind of substrates uh, in water is that also due to capillary forces, the, the, the electrolyte just creeps up a little bit, right? And if you, if you then choose the right point, then you, you get a, a, a part to part of the surface where the liquid layer just happens to be in the order of 20 nanometers, and then you can get your, your signal. Is, does that answer your question? Um, uh, no, my question is about adding powder to the droplets. Adding powder to the droplets. Oh, in the liquid droplet train experiment. You yes, mean? yes, that's, that's what I mean. Oh, doing. sorry. Uh, oh, gosh, um, I am not sure. I, I think they just bought a, a bulk of this uh, silicon oxide powder and just put it in a in a you know, just, just disperse it in a solution and, and just flow it through the needle. I think it's just, a, um, you, you just have to make some kind of salt gel process or, or you buy particles that are already dissolved in the, in the solution or you make them yourself. Uh, what, I, what I mean is the liquid layer on the, on, uh, on the powder should be very small. Yeah, so, so, so here, I mean, I mean, keep in mind that the droplet is really big, right? Compared to the particle size, the droplet is really big. So you really have a droplet of, let's say, 0.2 millimeters, so 200 microns, and dissolved in that droplet are all the nanoparticles. So the, the problem is then that the liquid layer on the powder should be very small. Yeah, exactly. So you will only, that's a good point. So you, you will only see those particles that are close to the liquid vapor interface, close to the surface of the droplet. That's absolutely right. Okay. You will only see those particles. Yes, for sure. 
Okay, excellent. So I think we can stop uh, for a while, have a coffee and come back in about 10 minutes or so at uh, uh, five, uh, 5.30, yeah, for the, for the third and last talk. So thanks again and I'll see you soon. I should um, just uh, try my talk. I think someone's going to help me do that. Yeah, that's right. There should be uh, some. Yes, madam, I'm here. Thank yes, you. I was waiting uh, for the questions. To be uh, can you share, please, your, your screen? Yes, yes, I can share. Um, do you have any audio or video in your presentation? No, I don't. Um, okay. Okay. Please launch the slideshow mode. The recording has come. Mm. Are you using double uh, screen? I am using a double screen, but I, I'm just using, do you see my screen actually? We do, but we also see all the, the comments, the next slide. The we bottom. see, in fact, the presenter way. Oh, no. How do we do this? You, you, you should unplug physically the second screen. Block it, like close it? No, no, unplug the cable. Oh, I can't, I don't know. Uh, but no, my that's my computer. I can't unplug the cable. Mm. But you, second, the second let me, screen. Let me you, try you, again, let me try again. Do you see it now? Yeah. Yes. No, now it's, it's okay. good. Okay, all right. It's just a matter of order of operation. Can you, can you change a couple of slides, please? Yeah. Okay, it works. Thank you. Should I just leave it like this then? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Okay, thank you. Sure. Tanya, I'll see you soon. Uh, do I pronounce yeah. your last name as Chuk? It is, it is, it is. That's right. right. Simon, thank you. You're welcome. Okay, see you later. Yeah, see you in a bit.
Tanya, I see you studied at Princeton. Got your bachelor. Yes, yes. I, I was there too for grad school. Oh, really? Yeah, yeah, in chemistry. In chemistry, uh huh. Whereas your bachelor is in engineering, is that right? Electrical engineering, yeah. It was uh, somewhat applied physics, but. Uh -huh. Have you been back? Yeah, I go back. I, um, yes. I've given some talks there. I, I um, yes, and and otherwise. Do you? Never been back since I graduated. No. Oh, well. <laughs> I know that the chemistry department moved, moved somewhere else. There is a new yeah. One. They they changed from I guess it was Frick. I still remember that. That's and uh, yeah, and uh, they have a very nice new building. It's quite good. Yeah, I heard they got. Uh, a really interesting kind of architecture and it's next to the physics department right yes yes it's not so yeah things are close there i'm not sure now but yes it's it's a very nice open architecture but um also they have their offices but there's a lot of light mm -hmm. a good amount of lab space and it's just very pleasant it's right next to the sports fields where they are playing uh, football and stuff like this. Uh, I yes. don't remember the Princeton Tigers and these kind of things. Uh, Ralph, they had to expand in that direction. That's right. Yeah. <laughs> have you been back, Ralph? I have been there, I think, last year with Roberto, yes. Oh, okay. Yeah, I've seen Roberto and Annabella Saloni there. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So Ralph was a postdoc there and I was a student. I was a postdoc with Roberto, yeah. Many oh, years ago. oh, I see. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And both Annabelle and Roberto, they come quite often here to Trieste. So. I can imagine, yeah. <laughs> I, yeah, I, yeah, I had a nice dinner with her. I don't think Roberto is there, but we had a dinner there in Princeton together. And, uh, yeah. So, but you were with the Giacinto, no? Or did I understand this wrong? I was with who? Giacinto Scolis, no? or not? No, no George Scolis, no, no. George. Ah, okay, then I'm messing up things, okay. <laughs> yeah, no, no, I am, um, yeah, I was at Albia now with Heinz Fry as a postdoc. Ah, and, okay. um Before that, my PhD was actually in um, transition metal oxides also, but in superconductivity in, uh, yeah. But I, Greg Scholes, I, I know quite well and I've seen him many times. Does he come to Italy? Giacinto, no, who? Oh, gee, oh, I thought you said Greg Scholes. I thought, no. Oh, no, no, he meant- No, no, I, I understood wrong. No, 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 no. He meant Giacinto Scholes. I think we had some other speaker who was a student or a postdoc with, uh, with Giacinto. I forgot. Yes, I don't remember. Um, Neither. There was somebody who in my in my on Tuesday, I think. Um, who was it? I forgot. Jörg, Jörg Libud. Ah, Libuda, yeah, yeah, yeah. Sure, 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 sure. Yeah. Ah, okay. Yeah. <clears throat> Elena Magnano, who's in Italy and she's at Electra, she was here in Colorado for a little while with me. Just I she, she was here with her husband, but we did some work together. Okay, so how about uh, starting? Yeah. 
yes. 30, 32 past. Okay, and all, all the participants are there, right? Yeah, okay. So I think we can start with the third and last talk of uh, today's session. And uh, the presentation will be given by Professor Tanya Chuk. And um, she graduated in, um, uh, got her PhD from uh, Stanford University. And then she moved to Berkeley um, uh, for a postdoctoral position. And then became an assistant professor at the uh, University of California, Berkeley. Uh, before becoming an associate professor at the University of Colorado, where she is right now. And her expertise is in the, in the use of time-resolved uh, spectroscopies to investigate uh, solid liquid interfaces for a variety of uh, catalytic processes. So Tanya, the stage is yours. Thank you very much for the invitation to speak here. So I'm going to be talking to you about how we're time-resolving a catalytic reaction at an electrode surface. And the, um, the focus will be how we're connecting experiment to theory. Experiment's primarily kinetic and at the heart of theory is thermodynamic. So how we're making those connections. Uh -oh. I can't advance now. Oh no, it was just advancing fine. I have to stop and share again, I think. There we go. This is my group at the University of Colorado Boulder, and I'm going to just highlight um, the people who have done the primary work. This is a current research associate, Ilya Vinogradov. This is a previous research associate, Aritra Mandal. He is now starting his own group in India. These are two more senior materials and science and engineering students, Hannah Lyle and Suryansh Singh. And Michael Polino um, from physics has also helped. I will also be discussing past work um, by Jihan Chen. He is now starting a, um, his own lab in Suztec, China. Dan Aschaffenberg was a previous postdoc and a theoretical collaborator, Das Pimaraju. So what we study as we've heard a number of times already is the water oxidation reaction. And that is because the sunlight energy is stored here on earth in chemical form through this reaction using a transition metal oxide catalyst. So this is the heart of solar to fuel generation. And we of course want to do that artificially. And this is an example of an integrated system where you have a photovoltaic that takes that solar light and converts it into charge. And then that charge is fed into a catalyst that does the water oxidation reaction. So solar cells are pretty well developed. The problem is integrating this with the catalyst and really understanding what is this catalytic process that's happening and how can we best integrate it. So um, this bottleneck here, um, and the reason it's so hard to understand is that it's inherently a molecular and dynamic process. So what we do in the lab is this water converting to oxygen and we're trying to put a lens on the intermediate steps of this reaction. And this will be at a transition metal oxide surface. The way we do this is using light spectroscopies where we have a pump that initiates the reaction and then probe that interrogates the intermediates. And we do that with a range of light spectroscopies. So catalysis, um, we're used to talking about as a catalytic cycle. I have um, the intermediates of this catalysis high highlighted here. There are four listed essentially because there are four proton and electron transfers. But in spectroscopy, we would like to map this to a potential energy surface such that each of these minima represent these metastable intermediates of the reaction. And then we can probe their electronic and vibrational states. So you'll also notice that this reaction is shown as spontaneous so that the potential energy surface is fully downhill. And that's also something that's quite advantageous. That's how we run our reaction because when it's fully downhill, essentially the spatial reaction coordinate is analogous to a time axis. So we can sequentially resolve the intermediate steps. That's just to say that catalysis should be causal. And so we should, um, a time would be a good probe of it. So I'm just gonna give a little background um, just as a framing of the oxygen evolution reaction um, or the steps we might look for. 
So this is in a single site mechanism where we have the electron and proton transfer steps, individual and sequential. Each has their own delta G. This would be a charge transfer step because we're taking the electron and proton away from the water and creating an oxidative intermediate. This is the first oxidative intermediate. And later on, those electron and proton transfer steps are also coupled with chemical steps, for example, OO bond formation. So if we are to drive this reaction fully downhill, what we need to do is put a potential on the electron. And that's shown here in this delta G versus reaction coordinate diagram. This is the downhill reaction. And you can see that it's flat or leveled here. And that just means that one of the steps here, the delta G3 is the rate limiting one. Okay. So there are a number of assumptions here. One, this is a single site mechanism and we have many sites on an oxide surface. Another big one is the computational hydrogen electrode where these are in equilibrium. Nonetheless, um, the Norskov school has been able to use this mechanism with scaling relations to, um, to essentially uh, compare materials activity. And those scaling relations come from the fact that one material or one metal site can only do this. If it does this reaction very well, it'll limit how well it does, for example, this reaction step because you're coming from the same metal site. So with those scaling relations, they can then make a reductive plot. So not one of all four delta Gs, but one delta G on the X axis here. And this is of the first oxidative intermediate. And what they're doing here is that essentially when this delta G1 is high, this is the rate limiting step and that's called the weak binding side. In other words, once you've done this electron transfer, this oxygen is weakly bound to the metal site. On the other hand, when this is low, that's not the rate limiting step and something else is. And for example, it can be suggested that delta G3 is because now it's strong binding of oxygen to the metal site. And so it's hard to create the oxygen oxygen bond. And so you get catalytic activity of these materials on the weak binding or the strong binding side and in between is the sweet spot. Well, this is nice and quite reductive, which is good for connecting experiment and theory. The problem, there are two major problems. One is that this X axis is largely computational. And so we don't have experimental handles on it of this metastable intermediate. The other one is when we do compare to experiment, we're comparing kinetics to essentially thermodynamics. And that's true whether we're doing the electrochemical current or time resolved spectroscopy. So when we're looking at experiments, we're looking at activation barrier heights, for example, the Arrhenius law, instead of these uh, thermodynamic delta G ones of the minima. If you do know something about that transition state, you can frame it in terms of transition state theory and an activation free energy. If we can separate out these electron and proton transfer steps so that you're just looking at an electron transfer step, you could use Marcus theory, and that would essentially relate um, these kinetics to delta G1 using a reorganizational energy. For example, the reorganization of the metal oxygen bonds around the intermediate. Now, one of the most general ways to um, relate kinetics to thermodynamics is using equilibrium constants. Their ratio should be the equilibrium constant. And what I'm gonna propose is that essentially time resolved spectroscopy is suited to do that because we can isolate these steps. Okay. All right, so with that, I am going to tell you about our experimental setup. What we have is a semiconductor. It's a strontium titanate single crystal and that's sitting in water. And when you do that, you get a nice um, electric field, a Schottky barrier in the semiconductor. And you can use that with light to initiate the water oxidation reaction. So that's been done a lot in the past. We simply do it with an ultra fast light pulse such that we can get the time resolution. And we get, this is a band gap light pulse. We get electron holes and we get quite good charge separation. Even though we're doing this with pulsed light, you measure steady state current. And this is an example of it. This is the current versus voltage. This is with the light on. This bending here is indicative of this band bending here of the Schottky barrier. We do our experiments essentially at zero volts versus SCD. So everything I'm gonna show you with current is there. So this tells you about the charge separation. We can also measure the oxygen and the electrolyte using a Clark electrode and we get approximately Faraday oxygen evolution of four folds to one, to one oxygen. 
So with that, we combine it with a pump probe setup. This is the steady state version. We initiate that steady state with this pump. And then with a delayed probe beam, we interrogate the reaction. That pulse sequence looks like this. So we have kilohertz light pulses. And so there's two milliseconds apart um, because one is used for um, the, the unexcited state. In between, we have the probe to um, interrogate the reaction. We use a full electrochemical cell. So this is the working electrode. This is the other half reaction with a reference electrode. We are constantly, we don't, we do do measurements with fluence to some extent, but we try to keep it as much as possible to a single fluence. That's uh, one light pulse can only excite as much as 2% of the surface sites. And that's essentially to keep these interfacial energetics the same. All right, so now I want to locate this semiconductor photo-driven surface within the oxygen evolution reaction, because that's usually thought of as a potential and a metal electrode. And the essential thing that I'm going to point out here, this is now the Gibbs free energy versus the reaction coordinate, is that we first put the sample in the electrolyte and it equilibrates. That alone can change the surface hydroxylation. And then we have an instantaneous light pulse that creates those valence band holes, and that's what drives the reaction downhill. This essentially, this is one of the things that's different, and it essentially separates out the electron and proton transfer step into two separate reactions. The first is a proton transfer step that occurs in the dark, and I'll be showing this to you uh, during the talk. So the proton transfer occurs in the dark, I'm going to write it that proton as a that's usually as a product here as a reactant hydroxyl anion that's because we're going to be changing the pH of the solution in basic conditions. But into the standard state, this would be a simple proton transfer reaction where you have a water absorbed surface hydroxylated here plus a proton It's the surface metal pKa. It is also what defines for a semiconductor, the shift in the valence band edge with pH. Okay. So after we do that, we, that's the equi explicit equilibrium in the dark. We then shine light and instantaneously create holes in the valence band, and they can trap preferentially on these hydroxylated sites to create the first oxidative intermediate. I'm gonna be calling this TiOH star. This can also have several different geometries. We're gonna be looking at one of them. Those geometries are based on where the oxygen is that's been oxidized and where the proton ends up. So that can be somewhere on the surface as well. So um, we use, uh, a lot, we actually learn a lot from the papers by Mikhail Sprick and Jun Cheng. Uh, they have calculated this free energy difference for a titanium dioxide surface. And um, that free energy difference is between a delocalized valence band hole and a trapped hole on the surface. They did that with DFT and AIMD calculations. And they also very nicely um, Put it within the context of Marcus theory, since this is a simple electron transfer reaction now. And I should say I now wrote that electron that's the product here as the reactant hole, because that makes sense in, in terms of a photo-driven reaction. Okay, so already I've probably complicated the idea of a computational hydrogen electrode, but um, this is very nice experimentally because we can use this dark equilibrated surface to understand what the photo-driven surface looks like. So if we're gonna do that, we better be able to measure it. And you get, got a good introduction to XPS in the last talk. Um, we use ambient pressure XPS. This is also at Berkeley at the beam line 11. We did that for our strontium titanate samples. And um, this is for undoped and, and essentially for lightly doped as well samples. These are um, AIMD simulations by Das Pimaraju. And this is a DFT configuration here where you have one water absorbed group on the titania and a neighboring one that's hydroxylated. We essentially did experiments on this and looked at the theory as well. And this is the number density of the hydroxylated groups. This is the number density of the water groups as a function of relative humidity or the water that you put in the chamber. And the, the calculations and experiments agree pretty well in terms of saying that strontium titanate is partial dissociation. In other words, every other titania is water absorbed and the other one is hydroxylated. Yeah. So if we want to um, preserve this surface in our experiments, we actually have to do 
a scanning mode. So we have to take our sample and literally scan it while we're doing the time resolved experiment. So this is what our sample looks like at the very end in an SCM. And what we did is we scanned it for um, faster and faster scans. So that's the green to the blue. And you can see that the kinetics converge. This is an optical probe versus the delay. We can also take and go to a new a fresh sample spot for a new delay position. You can see that traces the converged curve. So this is analogous to in a, cat in a homogeneous cat catalyst, just flowing the solution and taking the data as the catalyst goes by. And um, what it does for us is essentially says that the kinetics we measure is coming from a point on the surface that um, we can define in the dark. So the reason we have to do this is because, as we have heard, um, water oxidation restructures the catalyst. And we can look at this ex situ with both TEM and SEM. And the way we do this, I'm not going to go into the details of this, but we take the TEM thickness that's been changed um, after the water oxidation in the SEM area and the current evolved um, during the water oxidation, which we tried to keep with the scanning method about a standard deviation of 0.5% is, is the current. So we're always having the same current evolve. And then what we can do with that is look at the volume changed and assume that that entire volume change just dissolved into the liquid and think, understanding two holes per oxygen, we can put a limit of how much of the current went to restructuring the surface rather than water going to O2. And that is um, a limit of about 5%. And so 5% um, of it is going there, but that means a lot for the surface and it means a lot for your optical reflectivity. So that's why we do this scanning mode, but that, that's what's going on in, in the bulk. We can also look at this in elemental analysis and we see the main thing that's being dissolved is strontium into the solution. And we can correlate that with ICP data, okay? So with that, I'm going to be telling you um, a couple of stories. The first two are a deep dive into the whole transfer reaction at the strontium titanate aqueous surface. And the following two are um, the fate of these TiOH star intermediates. And I will be talking about screening, but that'll be at the end, okay? And it'll be involved with the fate of these intermediates. So first, um, about forming this TiOH star from which we're gonna use ultrafast spectroscopy. And the first thing I wanna talk about is the structure of these intermediates. And the way to get the structure, one of the good ways to get the structure is through vibrational spectroscopy. So this is a mid-IR probe beam, and this is an electrochemical cell. And inside this electrochemical cell, there's a little diamond. That diamond is an attenuated total reflection crystal, which takes this propagating mid-IR beam and creates an evanescent one. So one that's decaying in space. And what that allows us to do is be sensitive to molecular modes and not to bulk modes of the crystal, especially when we have that crystal sitting at a distance from the ATR crystal, such that we allow the wave to decay fully. That means in the background, when we're doing the ground state, we're not sensitive to the optical phonons in the bulk. All right, so with this, um, what we were able to do is identify one geometry of these intermediates, and that's the oxyl with the terminal oxygen and a proton transferred to a nearby site. That vibration associated with this intermediate looks like this. This is the change in absorption we see. We only get it when we have whole excitation to the surface. We can quench it with methanol, which means it's related to oxygen. And we do this detailed analysis experimentally using a phano resonance that describes these changes in line shape here. So briefly, a phano resonance is a discrete mode that's coupled to the continuum. And so we're in the middle of a solid liquid interface, so we have a lot of continuum. And we can couple actually to the solid side as well as the electrolyte side. So on this side, you're looking at changing the doping density of the strontium titanate, and that changes the electronic excitations within this window. I should say this is in the window of titanium oxygen stretches, but you can also have these uh, mid-IR electronic excitations. And those are these plasma excitations. They couple to that mode and they give you this asymmetric line shape. 
On the other hand, you can also couple to the electrolyte. So we can get differences by going from air to electrolyte and also by changing the duration of the electrolyte going to hydrogen to deuterium. And so what's coupling here in this wave number region is librational modes of the water. Okay. So um, this tells us that it's an interfacial mode. So experimentally, so we are sensitive to the interface there. Uh, I will say that they are very nice fan aligned shapes uh, in terms of what you can see out there. I will give you the, the details are here. Um, I will also point out that if you look at Ufano's paper in uh, section four, it's a perturb perturbative theory. So it means that all the couplings add. So that's why you can get the same fan or resonance when you have two continua that's coupling to. And I think this is a good example of that. All right, now I want to, that's the structure of one of the intermediates that we can get. And I'm gonna now go to the formation time of these TIRH star. And I'm gonna look at that first through, up. oh, I am sorry. I am sorry. So I, I jumped. Uh, so the, actually to get this vibration to be associated with the sock seal, there was quite a large amount of theory that was done. And that was done in collaboration with Das Maraju and David Prendergast. And what they did was a strontium titanate slab where they calculated the infrared um, absorption in the bulk, uh, in the, in the uh, ground state and with the oxyl configuration. This is the bulk optical phonon that we're not sensitive to in the spectroscopy. And what they found in particular in the oxyl configuration is that there's a separated M1 mode here that's due to vibrations of the oxygen underneath that oxyl. And you can think of this a bit in an inorganic chemistry way because what's happening here is when you trap the hole, you lengthen the titanium oxygen bond. This contracts the unit cell underneath and essentially separates this motion from the rest. So already just with the structure, we can start thinking about how do we map to this delta G1 axis of the first oxidative intermediate. And since this bond is lengthening, it essentially puts it on the weak binding side. Whereas Heinz Frey and Thomas Hammond, who have respectively studied cobalt oxide and iron oxide found upon hole trapping an oxo, which would be a shortening of the bond, which would heuristically place it on a strong binding side. Okay, so now I want to go to the formation of the TRH star intermediates. And the way we're going to do that is first optically. So you have a valence band, you have the holes that you're creating here. And when they trap on the surface, you're essentially taking a valence band state and you're creating a mid gap state such that that reaction is spontaneous for the hole. Now, when you do this, you're going to get new optical transitions. One will be an excited state absorption when you're promoting an electron. Another will be an excited state emission when you're from the valence band. Another will be an excited state emission when you're using an electron from the conduction band. Now, these are at different energies than this free energy because they're electronic, but more importantly, they're vertical optical transitions okay, that have to do with where the mid gap state is in the reaction coordinate, as well as the valence band and the conduction band. I will just say that this transition at the very end of the potential energy surfaces means you you're on the excited state potential energy surface. So you have an electron hole pair remaining here. You're on the ground state surface. So this has been um, looked at by a number of theorists and, um, and, and experimentalists. And because these are optical transitions, they're fairly broad. So you can be looking at the oxyl, but you can also be looking at the bridge intermediate, which is hole trapping on the lattice oxygen. Generically, they're called O minus, also hole polaron. And the only thing I wanna say about this is that essentially uh, both experiment and theory see UV vis transitions associated with these mid gap states and hole trapping. So we looked at that in strontium titanate under water oxidation. And so this is an example of our optical maps. We're going from picosecond to nanosecond time scales here from 2 EV to 3.2 EV. This is around the band gap of strontium tightening. And you can see in the middle of the gap that you have these absorptive transitions as well as emissive transitions. Okay. This is in closed circuit when we have current and this is open circuit when we don't. So I wanna concentrate now on this emissive transition because you can see that there is a clear growth. So that clear growth means that it could be related to the time scale of hole trapping. 
So we do get a very well-defined time scale, so 1.3 picoseconds of that growth. We can then identify the nature of it, since these are broad optical transitions, using our vibrational probe. And we find that the vibration of the oxyl also occurs with that same 1.3 picosecond time scale. So this emission we find nicely counts the TIOH star intermediates, whereas the absorption occurs within the um, ultrafast light pulse. So within the generation of electron hole pair carriers and then decays, which suggests it has a large um, portion of the population associated with the valence band holes. Now you might glean that from a simple diagram like this. This is just a suggestion as to why this is happening. But when you're taking a um, state from the valence band and you're using it to create the mid gap state, this transition is going to have uh, be complicated by essentially uh, the valence, the, the, the <laughs> complicated by the population of the valence band states you have left to create it. Whereas the electron and the conduction band here is not at all related to whole polar formation, so it can be a sort of independent count of uh, these mid gap states. So I have one more way of defining this as the time constant of the whole trapping reaction, and that's some recent work we did in the lab. So these are optical transitions, these are mid IR transitions. We also looked at coherent phonons. So when you create this TAOH star, you're distorting the structure at the surface for each one and you create many of them, you could create a continuum interfacial strain. And if you do that at an interface, what's going to happen is you're going to get an acoustic propagating pulse into the bulk of the crystal. And then our optical probe will scatter off of that acoustic strain pulse and across the interface and have coherent oscillations in the data. And those oscillations will have a frequency that depends on the optical wavelength. Because this propagating wave is propagating, you're going to get a dispersion relation. So this is the frequency of each of these oscillations versus the optical wavelength. And the model essentially includes the acoustic velocity and strontium tightening. These are the oscillations we see in the data. We can remove them by that model by knowing the dispersion relation. And what you have as data is essentially the phase of these oscillations, as well as the amplitude. And what Ilya Vinogradov did in the lab is he took um, a model that was done before, but expanded it to kind of the broadband spectroscopic range. And that model includes the electromagnetic interaction. So how these um, interfere with each other, as well as how that propagating acoustic strain is related to the interfacial strain. So this is the propagating wave and this is the interfacial strain. And so what's input into the model is the spatial decay of that interfacial strain, which is exponential, and a um, formation time, which is an exponential rise. And so this is that strain wave. This is what's related to the spatial decay. This is related to the formation time. And this is just a convolution with the time resolution of the experiment. And with that, you can start understanding the phase and amplitude of those waves. And um, particularly from the phase, we can get a good amount of information. So this is the phase in the closed circuit experiment. And what's fit here is that we get a formation time for the interfacial strain also of 1.3 picoseconds, which helps assign it to the TIOH star that are being created. Now it's also an independent measure because it's a phase. We can also do that with different experimental conditions. That phase also tells you that the essential, the nature of the strain at the surface, which is a C elongation versus the A, and that C is in the direction of the electrode electrolyte interfaces. So you can think of overall an expansion. We can also do this experiment in open circuit where we're not creating a lot of these polarons. And um, what we see there is we can only see these oscillations at very high fluence. And um, that phase, also the phase is very different. That all gives us that this is really um, carriers that are coupling to the lattice where this is polar on formation. 
All right, we can now, so we can do do something with that. Aurelia could do, did that really well with this model and I refer to you to this paper. We can get that formation time to the error that's shown there. Um, but the spatial decay is something that it's harder to get at. And what we could do is only put a lower limit. And that lower limit means that there's an upper magnitude to the strain of about a percent. So what I think that this does is, um, I'm just gonna summarize the formation of these TIOH star intermediates, is we can see them through the emission using electron volt energies. We can see the formation also using hundreds of milli electron volt energies. And we can also go to the gigahertz which is fractions of a milli OV and um, see them there. So that means that we can look at them from the electronic transitions. We can look at them from the normal modes they create as well as from the environment. This is kind of the continuum strain you would expect from a collective. All of these are states that you would expect to go into defining a free energy of the product TRH star. So we assume we know what we're starting with, which is valence band holes, and we're defining the states uh, of the product. The fact that we see a close 1.3 picoseconds between all of these states tells me that we can define a common temperature for that free energy. It might be some elevated temperature and most likely is because we're using an ultraviolet light pulse, but common enough to the states. So I think that's important. I think um, from an experimental point of view, this is also seeing this across the electromagnetic spectrum is important because we can use this as cards in the experiment. Here, this is better at calculate or seeing the total TIOH star population. Whereas this will track a particular geometry and this will tell me something about the environment. Okay. So with that, we have a time scale for the whole trapping event. Now I want to, that begs the question, can we get a reaction free energy difference from our spectroscopy? And the way, okay, so that's going to the next part of the talk, which is essentially these two edge star intermediates are created in the picosecond time scale and they're fairly stable. And that suggests that we could get an equilibrium constant from it. And the way we're going to get the equilibrium constant, though, is not going to be following exactly the time scale of the back transport, but rather shifting reaction conditions. So I'm going to shift the reaction condition of pH in the dark. That's easy for me to do and easier for the lab to do in um, pH, just change the uh, concentration of H minus through the pH and see how that affects the products that we create. Okay. So um, this is the spectra that we get. So again, these optical maps delay in energy, but now as a function of pH. And you can see that the emission becomes a lot more as we go to pH 13. So already suggesting that we're creating more TAOH star when we have higher pH or a higher hydroxylated surface. But if we're gonna get free energies and we're gonna get equilibrium constants, this reaction better be common to this data which means I wanna be tracking the common enough species on the product side and reaction kinetics that are essentially the same. So how do you go about answering that question? And one of the ways is to see if you can get a common basis set across the data. And that's what Ilya and Aritra did. They used a principal component analysis and both of them started with a singular value decomposition. And singular value decomposition for each of these optical maps immediately spits out for you that you have two dominant components. And then what Ilya did is he took those two dominant components for pH 13 and just reconstructed the pH 13 data from them. And then he took the two dominant components from pH 7 and used them to reconstruct the pH 13 data. This is a simple rotation of the basis. So that's a nice mathematical way. And we could do that as a function of a large range of pH. And so we're basically taking the time scale, the energy scale, and the pH as a data set and saying that we have a common basis. That's a mathematical description of it. But we really want this basis set to also reflect the optical spectroscopy. And that's what Aritra did. And he 
constrained the basis, so it's not a simple rotation basis anymore, but constrained it to have a pure absorptive component within our broadband window and a pure emissive component. And so this is the common spectra across that entire data set. So it tells us that essentially we have TIOH star species that we can count by this emission that is fairly common across the data. Okay. We can then look at the kinetics associated with these species. And we see that we have that picosecond component, and then we also have another 60 picosecond component. But the point here is the kinetics is common, and we're just changing amplitudes, so changing populations. So now I'm going to look at this two picosecond component that we've already assigned. And that is the one that has the nice pH dependence. So this is the amplitude as a function of pH, and this is its growth. The 60 picosecond component, which we haven't assigned yet, doesn't contain that pH dependence. Now, all of this analysis suggests that this is still related to 2AH star, but might be essentially from a different origin. I want to next take a look at this nice pH dependence here, which if you look at it is in fact a sigmoid. Okay. A sigmoid harkens of a reaction isotherm. So if I were to think about just a simple adsorption isotherm like this, and this would be the coverage of the hydroxylated species, if I tune the pH, I'm going more, I'm creating more of the product and this rise in the sigmoid would tell me something about its equilibrium constant. The fact that you have a flattening here in the sigmoid means that it's a Langmuir isotherm so that you have a limited amount of surface sites that can be hydroxylated. Now, this isn't of a simple adsorption isotherm. It is of a metastable intermediate. So this coverage is of TIOH star. So that what he immediately told us is that, well, we can construct an effective equilibrium constant here of the two sequential reactions. And in this reaction, okay, the limiting reaction would be what's conserved is the number of holes I've created by my laser pulse, which is either in the valence band hole or in the trapped hole. So in this reaction, I'm exchanging this for this, and this is my tuning variable. So as to say in this context that the number of holes we can create is only 2% of the surface site. So you have many more of these than of these that you can create. So with that, we combine these two reactions through the common reactant, which is the hydroxylated site. And we get, again, a Langmuir isotherm, but now an effective K. Okay, there's one approximation here, but it's quite negligible. So that K is now a combined K of the surface pKa and then of the whole trapping reaction. And this is how we define our equilibrium constants. So what I think this shows is that if you can time resolve intermediate populations, you can, and they're metastable, you can start getting to thermodynamic parameters of the driven catalytic surface. So you might ask me, well, I said a lot about this reaction here. What about this reaction? Well, okay, maybe you can tune it with pH, but is that really happening? So what we can do is we can change our sample to change the nature of this reaction. And so we did that by going from lightly doped strontium tightening. Everything I've been showing you here is lightly doped strontium tightening. Niobium replaces the titanium here. And that's what gives us the Schottky barrier. Um, you can also get the Schottky barrier, get water oxidation with a highly doped sample, get all the restructuring as well. Everything happens here too. But here you have a pH dependence and here you don't. And you can, that bears fruit in the principal component analysis. There's pH dependence here and there's no pH dependence here. If you look then at the ambient pressure XPS, which is telling us what the surface looks like under neutral conditions, you see that in the, partial, in the lightly doped um, strontium tightening, you get a partially hydroxylated surface. So this mimics a lot the undoped sample that I showed you earlier. And so these are the hydroxyl groups we're fitting. These are the water absorbed groups. This is the carbon species. This is the lattice oxygen, and this is gas phase water. 
When we go to a, 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 a highly doped sample, um, we have essentially a, a factor of two to three increase in the hydroxylation. And that suggests a closely fully hydroxylated surface near the neutral conditions. So we're, de we're dealing, we are getting to the detailed coverages here, but I will say that if you look at the low relative humidity range, when you have water, the amount of dissociation that you have there is about less than 10%, maximum 10%, which is, this is at least 50%. And then it grows with, with relative humidity. At ultra high vacuum, these samples look quite alike. Okay, so it's only when you add water that does it, does it change. So um, this gives a picture. Oops. This gives a picture of essentially a lightly doped sample where we have hydroxylated surface sites among a water network. So there are two reasons I believe we can get this sigmoid is that we can push the hydroxylation in the basic pH range. And the other reasons is we're using the optical emission to average over all the different intermediates of the surface. So we can get basically something that's common on the product side that we're looking at. So doing this, I think we were able to isolate the first reaction step of, of water oxidation using the surface acidity in the dark. Should say this is a collaboration with Jan Rosmeisel. He did teach me a number of things about the oxygen evolution reaction, made me more confident about the model. Um, with that, I want to now place these two reaction steps. So now we have a surface pKa and a hole trapping reaction on the one delta G1 that's the usual one that people use for volcano plots. Okay, so these are these two steps here. Okay, and we want to create a delta G1 that we can put on an electrochemical scale. For example, weak binding here to strong binding there. Okay. So this is non-trivial and it requires a couple of steps. One is that we start off with the equilibrium constant that we measure. And however, that equilibrium constant that we measure is one of surface coverages where we have a laser creating many holes in the valence band. When you want to compare to calculation, this is a single site. So you take a single hole, single TiOH minus site is, is calculated, and um, then you get the delta G, and you can get write an equilibrium constant for that. But we have a degeneracy of holes on the valence band side. So you have to divide, basically divide the partition function by that hole density. So that's what we do to um, connect to the calculation to a single particle like delta G. Right. And then what we do is we have two parts here. We have the pKa and then we have the whole trapping delta G. We take from calculation the pKa, which is a pKa of eight. And then we take a calculation that was done for specifically for strontium titanate by DAS. We take the um, highest one that was calculated, so minus 0.4 eB. We put that in and then we derive back our experimental K. And that is a uh, five. In our experiment, we get an equilibrium constant of 150. So what that would do would push the sigmoid from pH 11.7 for K of 150 to pH of 13 for K of five. Okay. So it gives you an idea of the difference. With that, we can um, then essentially extract out that minus 0.4 UV and add it to the valence band edge to put it on the electrochemical scale. So in this context, in this delta G1, all the pH dependence is in the valence band edge. So that's the surface pKa reaction we're saying. And that on an RHE scale would give you one number, on an NHE scale would change with pH. So with that, we can put that on um, these volcano plots. And this is then gives us essentially 2.4 electron volts, puts it on the weak binding side. Now this is still approximate. And I think that it's partly maybe theory, but not uh, from an experimental side. I think the major issue is this part here, dividing by the hole density, because not all of the holes we initiate with the laser pulse are necessarily gonna be evolved in this one reaction. 
However, even given that, I am comfortable with putting it on the weak binding side because essentially these equilibrium constants can change by a lot. And this is a reasonable place for it to be um, for the pKa and, and for, for what the delta Gs are. Um, okay. And it also, just the idea of seeing an equilibrium constant is important for defining a metastable intermediate of a reaction. So um, with that, I am now going to go to the fate of these TARH star intermediates, and that's going to be on the microsecond time scale. So I'm going to start with just a proposed mechanism, and this is just a proposed mechanism right now um, to guide our discussion. So the idea is, is we create these first OER intermediates all at early time scales, and then there's essentially dark and chemical steps that leads you to the rest. And so that would then mean we're gonna be looking at the decay of these intermediates towards those dark and chemical steps. And so it suggests um, because we're looking at a decay and because the dark chemical steps, the transition state theory would be important. A hallmark of this would be if essentially you create all of these initially and then the time dynamics is fairly uneventful until you get to the transition state and then you see a marked decay. Okay. So we looked at the emission again at um, microsecond time scales. And we're looking at this here with just a single wavelength probe at 400 nanometers. And it's okay, it's fairly uneventful in the nanosecond time scale, but we are now going to be looking at that more closely um, this was done with a 30 nanosecond laser, but now we have a better one that we can really track with a picosecond through the microsecond with the full broadband spectroscopy. But this is what we've done in the past. We do get a marked decay on the microsecond time scale. So why you might see a decay in the emission um, going towards the next step in the cycle is because these TAOH star intermediates contain charge, and so they would be in the middle of the gap. But if you form some neutral oxygen-oxygen bond, they would no longer be in the middle of the gap. So we now um, take this and we fit it with bi-exponential decays, and we get distinct time constants, so marked microsecond times constant. We get one of six microseconds. Oh, shoot, something. Okay one of um, eight microseconds, one of 60 microseconds. And we have um, the fact that we're fitting this with these, um, this kind of exponential, these bi-exponential decays means we have two parallel decay routes. So the TIRH star population starts out here and then it bifurcates into two populations. That bifurcation is pH dependent. So at higher pH, the faster pathway is favored and at lower pH, the slower pathway is favored. We also deuterate the solution. So we go from hydrogen to deuterium and we get a very nice and marked kinetic isotope effect of 1.75 on the slower route. That you can see directly in the kinetics when you compare the pH, the pH solution to the PD solution here. So blue to red. So that suggests that we have some on the slower route and some marked OH breaking event that is screened. So it's a low K, K, uh, KIE. All right, this bifurcation is also very dependence. So we change the salt concentration in the solution and keep the pH constant. And you can see um, the changes in the bi-exponential decays that we analyzed here. So these are the amplitudes of those populations as a function of um, the salt concentration. This is the slower pathway. That's what's favored at low salt concentrations. And you can see that the faster pathway grows in with direct exchange to the slower pathway. So we haven't normalized at all these amplitudes. Okay. And it does so up to a certain saturation point. Okay, so this direct exchange is what suggests to me that the screening layer is involved. So here, if you basically increase the salt concentration, you can screen a constant charge at the surface with a single layer of that salt. 
Whereas when you have less of that salt concentration in solution, you would have a thicker screening layer. Okay. So the reason I haven't mentioned the screening until now is because in the whole trapping reaction, we don't see a dependence on the salt concentration. And why we might not see that is because we have a constant voltage and we have a constant fluence excitation. So a constant amount of charge here that we're putting on the electrode. Okay. And so the potential difference between that and the counter ions would be the same with increased and maybe the potential difference is what's relevant for the whole trapping reaction. Whereas in this microsecond time scale, what we are changing is the electric field. So when we go to higher concentrations, we're creating a screening layer in a thinner distance. This is just the Debye length, which would imply that the electric field increases. So the suggestion here is that this bifurcation is related to strengthened electric field, um, allowing essentially the faster pathway to come into play. Okay, so that's just a suggestion based on this bifurcation and where this um, effect saturates. So I've been talking about these pathways and of course these pathways should relate to activation barrier heights. So we should be able to modulate those activation barrier heights. So we did that first in the conventional way using temperature. And this is the Arrhenius law. You have the log of those kinetics versus inverse temperature. And you get slopes for each of them in the range of 0.4 to 0.5 EV for the activation barrier height. You get prefactors in the terahertz range, which by transition state theory would suggest that there's vibrational motion that helps you get to the transition state. So that's a conventional way to identify activation barriers, but there's another way we can do that which is using the screening dependence. And um, so what we find is that you have a log of the kinetics and those rate constants are also dependent on the screening. And here we now cast that screening as an ionic strength. And those rates increase with ionic strength. Okay. So how screening might be involved is that these counter ions can screen a charged transition state helping it, if these are like intermediates, they can help it get through that transition state to the next step. Now, what I have shown here, which I learned about earlier on, is that uh, the bronsted Birium equation, I learned it predated actually transition state theory. And what it said it was is usually used for homogeneous solutions is that um, is essentially describing this screening of a charged transition state, where Z is the charge in the transition state, um, the square root describes that it's a screening effect and I describe is what we modulate in the experiment. Okay. And what we get is approximately a um, square root behavior. Uh, but what we also get is a charge that's reasonable and that it's less than a full proton transfer. And the charge is higher for um, the pathway that's favored at higher ionic strengths. So um, what we then um, did is this is basically kinetics of the decay of this TIRH star population. We simply mapped it onto um, two different possible mechanisms for these activation barriers. So there's a lot more work to do here and to elucidate these mechanisms. We just mapped it onto them based on the reaction condition dependence. And so we mapped the faster pathway to biradical recombination to form the OO bond. And um, that's because it happens at higher ionic strengths. The nucleophilic attack pathway we mapped onto the, um, to the uh, slower pathway, essentially because it occurs with some HDKIE and it is slower, so it would involve some lattice intermediate. All right, um, there's a lot more to do, as I said, we are, uh, planning to do right now with those maps that I showed you, those optical maps to do vibrational spectroscopy on them using femtosecond stimulated resonance Raman spectroscopy. And that's where we hope to try to resolve the oxygen oxygen bond on the microsecond time scale and maybe something about these transition states. So that's experiment long time and coming. And part of it was to get really nice optical spectra was, was point one. So I want to just introduce two other experiments we've done, not on strontium titanate, but on two other ones. And it's just one slide, actually. 
but it has to do uh, with the screening layer as well. So uh, the fact that these TRH star population bifurcates like this and that it, there might be dark chemical steps that guide the bond formation uh, suggests that surface mobility is really important. And that's something where it's really hard to get to experimentally. And it's hard to get to experimentally on transition metal oxide surfaces, especially. But early on, we looked at this with the, just a simple, simple conventional semiconductor gallium nitride. And what we did is we um, created a grading of charge carriers in the semiconductor. And we could um, change that grading spacing and then we can diffract off of that grading using our spectroscopy, and this is the diffracted pulse, to get the rate at which the, decay, the grading is decaying, so the grade leaving. And that would tell us about the diffusion or the lateral diffusion along the surface. So this is done in an undoped gallium nitride semiconductor, and this is the rate at which that grading decays versus the Q spacing of that grading, which we can control. And from the slopes, what you get is the diffusivity, right? And it's the charge diffusivity. It can be of electrons, it can be of holes, or it can be of electrons and holes, right? So in undoped, we basically mimicked what, the, what was seen before um, for undoped gallium nitride, also for using this transient grading spectroscopy. And then what we did is we simply put it in a semiconductor surface. Uh, in a, so then we did, took, instead of an undoped gallium nitride, we took an endoped gallium nitride surface and we looked at it in air and we got the same slope as we would get for the, um, for the undoped one. But when we put it in um, solution, uh, we got a much higher slope, which means a higher diffusivity. And so uh, that suggested that essentially when we have charge carriers localized at the interface with an electrolyte, uh, that electrolyte helps that charge, it increases its diffusivity or its mobility. And you can see that by all the checks we made here on the different types of samples, just undoped air, undoped electrolyte, undoped nen gallium or doped gallium nitride air and with two electrolytes. And here is only when we get that factor of two increase. So we need the charge and the electrolyte to increase um, the charge diffusivity. And this is of holes at, at the interface. So Tony, I think we lost you. We cannot hear you anymore. Tanya, if you hear us, hear us, please disconnect and reconnect. Hmm. Let's see. She comes back. <laughs> Something like this had to happen at a certain point. <laughs> That is uh, what I was afraid of. <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> but in your case, it worked. <laughs> yeah. Perhaps someone can text her a message or some other way. I just. Mm. Yeah. 
Yeah, I wrote an email, but if the internet connection went down. Yeah. But somehow I doubt that the internet connection is completely down to Boulder. No? Does someone of you have her presentation? No. no. We don't. Also, even if you had the presentation, we wouldn't be able to explain yeah. what is inside. <laughs> <laughs> uh, it can be done by phone. It already happened. Ah, okay. If one of you... Uh... Oh, no. Okay. You can give her a few minutes tomorrow, no? Yeah. Yeah, that sure. Be, that is also true, yes. Yeah, tomorrow we have a shorter day, so we'll be totally fine. <clears throat> Well, we can give her a couple of minutes to see if she comes back. If not, does someone have her from phone the number? Question. Yes, it was all. My, all yeah, my this class. is Francesca. I texted her. I can try to call her and see if she picks okay, up. She's in. She's in. Okay. You are muted. Oh, there you are. Uh, that's my thing. I just. It's all right. Did you hear the last part of my talk or was it gone? Depends on how long did you keep talking. <laughs> exactly. Um, yes. The, the oh, cut so was something like uh, five, five minutes ago we had the cut, let's say. But I didn't pay attention to the slide number. <laughs> was it, oh God. But, but, but we can noticed. confirm which one you... You, you said five minutes. Uh, so In total, I would say, yes. This one did you see? Yeah. Yeah. And this one did you see? Yes. Okay, so it's just the last one. Okay, good. Okay, add my, my conclusion slide. Okay. All right, but it might have been worse for the questions. I don't know. Anyone have questions? You close the sharing again. Oh, do you want the sharing? Okay. Okay, let's do the sharing. No, please go ahead and finish your, your presentation, even if we run 10 minutes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah, go ahead and finish. finish okay, I'm just going to uh, uh, get, I don't know what I just did. Um, presentations, summer. Oh, God, what the is... <laughs> Okay, I, I will get this, okay. Excuse me, stop, one second. Well, at least the last, yeah. Okay, share. Do you see it? No, yep. you see my, oh no, I have to share it and mention slideshow, confirm. Do you see this? Uh, we see. No, you see the other one. The presentation mode. It will be here. Okay, now you see it, right? Yep. Okay, I'm gonna go to my last one. So this is the what you didn't see. Um, so basically charge diffusivity mobility is really important at these interfaces. It could be very important for dark chemical steps, but it's really hard for us to see it in transition metal oxides. Early on, we did something on a simple semiconductor where we created a grading of carriers inside the semiconductor and we diffracted off of it. And that grading um, essentially as it um, disappears is gonna tell you about the diffusivity of charge along the interface. So this is the decay of that grading, that rate versus the Q spacings. And from the slope, basically you're changing how close these peaks are to each other. But from the slope, you can get that diffusivity constant. 
And so this is an undoped gallium nitride. This is an air and an electrolyte. So we get the same thing in both. And um, that was done before and we could say, okay, we had the same thing that others had. And then we went to uh, end doped gallium nitride surface. And there you would get mid gap states. So you would get charged into you know, things that are trapped at the interface. And when we did it at, in air, we essentially get the same thing for the whole diffusivity that we would get in the undoped. But when we put it in the electrolyte, we got a higher diffusivity. And so that suggested that essentially a picture like this, when you trap the charge, the electrolyte helps it move along the surface. And so here's this undoped gallium nitride in air and electrolyte, we get the same whole diffusivity in endoped gallium nitride in air, or um, we get the same whole diffusivity, but in electrolyte, we get a factor of two higher. Then the other part was that we were, so this is all about the screening layer essentially. And um, we also looked at that in a battery electrolyte, not the diffusivity, but here we're just counting charge, um, the positive charge in the lithium ions and negative charge in the perc thorate. And we're using this ATR spectroscopy to find pretty powerful to get at that. And we looked at the number density through our absorption cross section versus potential. This is the nominal PZC, which we define as the open circuit voltage go into the negative side or positive side and accumulate lithium ions here, accumulate perchlorate ions here. And, um, and then we did an agreement with Oleg Borodin on this, Oleg Borodin did the ND simulations. What you do require for this is putting a factor for the surface enhancement that we observe on these gold electrodes. But that factor is on every potential the same. And then just this is the summary slide if people want to see. This is essentially what I talked to you about is forming these TOH star intermediates through their electronic states and emission, through their normal modes with vibrations, and something about the continuum strain within coherent phonons that all gave us a whole trapping energy of 1.3 picoseconds. It allowed you to ask, to ask the question, well, what is the reaction free energy difference? And we isolate the equilibrium constant of this by changing, by, by the century, the surface acidity in the dark and we got an equilibrium constant of 150, which placed this on the weak binding side of the volcano. And um, then we looked at the fate of these intermediates at six uh, at microsecond time scales. We see two transition state pathways, which we loosely assign to these two mechanisms. And then hopefully I've given you an understanding that this is, we, it's in, it is important to isolate individual reaction steps within a continuous cycle. And I think phenomenological theory is a good bridge to try to help you know, theoretical descriptors be related to time-resolved kinetics. I think if we see this more and more, we're gonna see that there's gonna be a lot of opportunities to select for different path pathways by, for example, surface modification. I showed you one with the salt concentration in the EDL. So that's my talk. <laughs> I don't know if there... Thank you. Okay. Yeah. So okay. I will ask uh, the audience if they, if they have any questions. And if not, I have a tone, but please go ahead. If there is, yeah, uh, James Darrant, mm -hmm. uh, just a second. Uh, yeah, you can unmute yourself. Yes, I have, it's fine. Um, thank you, Tanya, that, that was very nice. I, I, I enjoyed. Um, I, I was, uh, obviously, one of the things we, we think a lot about is what the energy of these surface um, holes or it, 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 um, the, the TIOH you talk, you know, states are on the surface. And you can consider the energy of those states versus the band band edge, mm -hmm. but probably it's more relevant to consider it versus the energy of localized bulk polarons. Mm -hmm. um, I, 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 I wonder how... Uh, 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 and. I'm, there's quite a lot of work now on electron polaron formation, yeah. but I'm not so familiar with whole polaron formation. I, I wonder what you think about how much this, the relaxation energy of the surface TIOH groups might be compared to the relaxation associated with whole polaron formation. So that, that's actually been um, calculated in strontium titanate, and then I'll say experimentally, but the calculation is that um, this was done by Genoti for strontium titanate, and um, he did and he found for the, that there is a whole, because there's electron polarons in, in strontium titanate, and I draw those kind of close to the conduction band when you dope. 
but the whole polaron is minus 0.05 EV versus the valence band edge. And this is what DAS calculated for, for these bridge and auxiles is minus 0.4. So that's the difference in the calculation. Um, experimentally though, um, one should keep in mind that even if you have like a small difference to, or small free energy to create the whole polaron, it can create uh, UV vis absorptions because these are optical transitions that are reaction coordinate. And for example, <laughs> Genoti finds, and he actually calculated that for the bulk hole polaron is 2.5 electron volts would be the emission. And um, so how we relate this to surface holes is um, because it's essentially sensitive to the surface and not the bulk, um, but, and, and that they are much more favorable to, to be created. I also think, and I, I know uh, Mikhail Sprick has probably calculated this in TiO2, the bulk versus this is surface. Yes, uh, I, um, I never trusted this result. Can I, can I show this to you? Sure. I have to uh, share my screen. Is that possible? Mm, oh, I will stop sharing. Mm, maybe this is asking too much for me. I'm not, I'm not sure whether, can I? Um... No, then I will just tell the result. <clears throat> so this is a <clears throat> calculation we did uh, with uh, Jung and what we found <clears throat> very disturbingly that the A, the reorganization energy for the OH minus to OH dot is the same as in bulk water. And not only that, even the levels themselves are in the same place. So the surface OH minus is very hard to distinguish from a bulk OH minus. Uh, both with respect to the levels and of course the reorganization energy. We know where the hole is because that's where the proton is missing. Mm -hmm. But I never dared to publish it and Jung probably was rather happy that I didn't because it can be a DFT error, right? <laughs> you understand what I'm saying? The pictures are the same. So you're saying that the OH minus to OH radical in the electrolyte is the same as on the surface? That's right, yeah. Uh -huh. Yeah, I mean, what we're looking at is on the surface, right? There's, uh, we don't see OH minus an OH radical in the solution based on our No, no, I understand that, but yeah. I, yeah, um, yeah. I mm -hmm. was just mentioning that. Uh, so my, my, my explanation was that the tight hydrogen bonding of the guy on the surface is essentially the same as in the water. But that was, that, of course, me that is, speculation. Yeah, that is yeah, it's surprising to me. Because I, I remember your paper with the transient OH. I don't mm -hmm. know if you guys remember the, T, the JPCC, you had a transient OH, and it was very short amount of time. And then it became the TIOH star that I'm talking about and the free energy difference. Yeah, yeah. No, I worked this out a little better now. I can send you the picture by email and you can stare at so it. That's not that transient OH, but it's, it's uh, okay. Yeah, I, I would love to see it. Yeah, yeah so the, as you understand, the hole, the unrelaxed hole is below the valence band. So obviously it uh, doesn't exist for too long. Huh? Mm -hmm. Okay, I'll, uh, I'll send it to you. Oh, 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 the unrelaxed hole of the TOH uh, minus or the transient TIOH is below the valence band, so it doesn't live that long. Yeah, yeah, that's, that, that's, that's published, right? That's not something about, you're Yeah, about one volt. Yeah, yeah, yeah. A question, a question I have mm -hmm. um, is regarding um, hole accumulation at the surface. Mm -hmm. So uh, you might have seen uh, uh, Professor Daron's talk Mm -hmm. uh, the fact that uh, uh, holes can accumulate to the surface and then drive a series of chemical reactions, chemical steps. And uh, it seems to me that your cartoon in which you had that cascade of steps, uh, and you mentioned the fact that the first one is light driven, and then you have a series of steps that are dark steps. Yeah. Right? So uh, is this consistent with the picture that uh, Professor Dar Darant has uh, proposed? So you accumulate the holes at the surface, right? Yes. And then some chemistry happens, right? But uh -huh. this chemistry is not a sequence of uh, one electron 
uh, of steps, yeah. but it is, uh, can be single steps, can be multiple steps. So uh, this is like uh, uh, thermal chemistry, it's not uh, an electrochemical step. Is that the yeah. thing that is emerging from your work too? I would say that on TiO2, so we're very much on strontium titanate, but on TiO2, the picture that you just said, I would say is consistent with this. We still have to look at this picosecond to nanosecond range, like I said, and also assign the 60 picosecond times constant. But if I look globally, that idea that there's like something, on, basically we have a similar optical cross section at nanoseconds that, at, hundreds of nanoseconds that we did at two nanoseconds. And that's a little bit, on a, so, but we wanna do that in detail. I wanna say we're gonna say, is it, but then a marked decay afterwards suggests that these electron transfers are happening early and then there's dark chemical steps. And but, yeah, that's, that's, yeah. But now you also have a way to, uh, to measure the, um, the coverage of these intermediates. Mm -hmm. right? So, you could do the very same thing that Darant has done with the optical spectroscopy to correlate uh, uh, coverage of uh, hole trapping intermediates and uh, photoelectrochemical performance to see if indeed there is this uh, uh, multi-hole uh, ray determining step or not. So it would be two different ways, two different spectroscopies to address uh, yeah. the very same issue, right? So one thing that we don't do a lot of, but we do some of is affluence dependence, which is essentially what James Duran is using. Part of the reason we don't do that is because we wanna keep the interfacial energetics the same for what we're looking at and then we're spanning the reaction conditions. Okay. So in, in the, what I wanna to do to make a connection here is that in order for us to really make this connection, we need both the TAOH star as the well as the bulk holes. We need a count of both. Uh -huh. And I think that's why I put that the TOH star is a good count of emission that through the emission through for all these reasons. Whereas the absorption has a lot, and I showed on one of the slides, it's, it's really with the ultra fast light pulse. So which with carriers coming and then has a lot of the valence band holes. But I can't say that it's all the valence band hole population because it is a 1D spectroscopy. So it's the populations of both. And we're using the valence band states for that transition that are the ones that are also creating the whole polarons or creating the TRH star. So the time dynamics is going to be complicated by the valence band states, how they're changing in time, as well as the whole polaron states, how they're changing in time. Whereas the electrons are coming from the conduction band are independent. The other thing is you're gonna have overlapping transitions. That's another thing. And the reason I just point out this is because it's two EV, we have a peak there, people assign this to O minus and oxides and so on. But I think if we get more data for both of these transitions, perhaps we can take out the populations and then for example, do affluence dependence to see, because one of the things that also, when we're doing the equilibrium constant, what I would like to know is how many holes are involved exactly to create this amount of TAOH star. And we're gonna, we have more holes than we have TAOH star from what it looks like, right? So, and, and it could be 50% or something. So calibrating that would be good. And so I think what we need is a broadband spectroscopy where we have more information on the two populations and then affluence depends. I will say in terms of fluence, because I didn't get to in the talk, is that you're going to saturate the emission. If we do this scanning mode, where we're really looking at a fresh sample spot, you saturate the emission at a certain fluence, which makes sense because you only have so much TIOH minus there at the surface that you're using. Whereas the absorption increases linearly. That linear increase though, can be a valence band holes you're creating or a total charge at the surface, right? It, linear increases, one has to, you know, and deconvolve a bit. So I, I think that, I think, yes, I think that in short, we should be able to eventually make that. I also think theoretical input would be good here for the optical uh, admission and absorption and what it's going on. Perhaps on the ideally DFT calculation, but I know that's very hard for electronic transitions. But um, even in terms of what I'm talking about, like if we have kind of like, you know, Fermi's golden rule, you know, what are the, you know, I can give you the number of holes that we create and things like this. And that's something that would be good. 
perhaps as you, as, as for you, you were referring to my work, Simonia, I, I, maybe I should have a little comment on that. Um, yes. As far as I understand, a lot of the first part of your talk kind of um, was the formation of the surface holes, which then in, in my talk, I, I, I focused on how those holes uh, or, or, or surface um, uh, TIOH groups come together to drive water oxidation. So in that sense, I think what we do is quite complementary. Mm -hmm. um, the bit where maybe we have some differences on the time scale of decay of those holes at the surface, um, where, where you see quite a lot faster kinetics than we observe. And um, I, I, I am aware that in ultra fast measurements, it's quite hard sometimes to avoid um, recombination losses, and, I, I, and I, I know you've done quite a lot of work to try and show it's not recombination and all this sort of thing. And, and maybe um, strontium titanate is really unusual at having much faster kinetics than other materials. Um, we've, we've started to look at that and we haven't, and I'm aware the measurement, the reason why we do our measurements with these long LED pulses is to try to um, uh, avoid the um, the, the, the issues of the ultrafast laser pulses and all the, the high intensities they create and all this sort of thing. Um, but it, it, we're certainly planning to do some um, lower light flux measurements on the STO to see if we get similar time scales to you or, or rather slower time scales. Mm -hmm. So yeah, one? we, uh, yeah, sorry, you're asking, yeah, the, you know, we do do use this ultrafast laser pulse, but we do get 75% and greater quantum efficiency with it. And I know that sounds unusual, but it's not that unusual in the context of a single crystal. Yeah, because yeah, yeah. yeah. if you actually use the diode well, I mean, the diode is is what, and but it does limit that we. It's hard to get to other materials, so we use this as a model system, and then um, in the future try to get it to other materials too with it. But I think you were pointing out microsecond time scales versus your millisecond. Yeah, because because most of our water clock stage is pretty second to seconds. Um, yes and no. It depends on what spatial region you're talking about. Like these microsecond kinetics are not inconsistent with OO bond formation because I mean oxygen evolution might have you know so OO bond formation it's half an EV electron volt scale in terahertz. So the the time scale you're looking at also depends on the spatial scale you're looking at you know, and sure. where you're going from. And so, um, yeah, I, I, I think it's an, and, and we do, we do are seeing oxygen in the, in the electrolyte. We are seeing ultra fast, um, yeah, we're seeing charge separation. Oh, and so cool. most of that charge, yeah, most of that charge is leaving at microsecond time scales, but it might be that other things are rate limiting of the reaction, like the oxygen evolving. Um, and it's very hard for me to connect to the turnover rate yet. And um, because it's very site dependent, how many sites are involved in that millisecond time scale that people talk about or second hours. I know that our, for our spatial site, we're, we're doing one oxygen per, the, per site per second for, for the spatial region that we have, which is not inconsistent with, with some of the things on oxides. And that, that's how, what we produce and what, um, what we produce is that, and then Ooh, I forgot what else I was gonna say. It was, I think it's fine. I, <laughs> okay, I, I, I want to say, you know, I, I, I hope in the next. Oh, few, oh, oh, oh minutes, this, I'll, 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 you know, there's a lot of things of operando and in situ. And that kilohertz laser pulses aren't catalysis necessarily. And I, I just, I don't know how to answer that because catalysis is inherently transient and that transient steps give you a steady state. We pulse that catalysis and we get a steady state. We get a steady state on those scans of 0.5% standard deviation. We can, we can do that on a clean enough sample, you know, do that for, for a while. So the idea that catalysis isn't inherently something that you can control by pulsed excitation to get a given steady state, I don't think is true because you can also continuously light excite and just continuously have holes, but that's just one rendition of that steady state because the process itself is inherently transient. I mean, I suspect 
if we get yeah. into too much detail on the transit vectoscopy, that might not be quite yeah. everyone. We, we can have more discussion over yeah. um, the best way to get no, into the detail. I, I, that was not just to you, James. It was just a general what I've been thinking. Yeah, no, I follow, no, I follow. Yeah. Okay, so yeah, I think we're done for today. Thanks a lot to all the speakers and uh, to all the people that participated in the discussion. And uh, we can reconvene tomorrow in the afternoon for the last part of the of the workshop. So thanks ah, again. Vander, Professor Vanderkolt, nice to meet you, actually. I, I uh, Elena Magnano was in my lab for a little while and we did some resonant XPS. I know nothing about it, but she did it for us. And then, yeah, I just want to tell you. Nice to meet you too. Great talk. Yeah, yeah I enjoyed great it. talk to you too, yeah. <laughs> Okay, see you. Bye-bye. Bye, everyone. Bye -bye. Bye.